Thanks, you can uh, just keep on trucking. Yep, I agree. Do sea urchin speed. Yeah. 100 centimeters? 100, 100 centimeters a second. Hey team, we're back online. Roger. Thanks. I wonder where Julian was calling from. Didn't seem to be Data Lab. From Data Lab. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't light up. Interesting. Oh, weird. That's because they got those super secret stuff. Down That's there. true. I am everywhere at once. <laughs> He's in <laughs> omnipotent voice. With omnipresent the voice. Within the matrix. Well, I don't have a data lab online. Ah. No data lab for you. No data lab. They don't want us to call in and harass them. <laughs> no, it's more or less the pilots don't want to be called in harass, so that too. They, they, both they try to limit whatever <laughs> buttons. I try to, to limit the I number of buttons you guys get, because otherwise you get overwhhelmed sometimes. <laughs> right. We like pressing buttons. Overwhelmed. I was going to say, we'll start making buttons. requests for <laughs> Grafana changes mid-dive. <laughs> <laughs> just, just what they want to happen. <laughs> That's why we don't get to call them. <laughs> I see. <laughs> oh, wow, the HD camera, the 4K camera has an internal temperature. Oh, yeah? Oh, what temperature is it? 31 C. Really? Mm -hmm. oh. Bridge nav. Five That's zero meters, zero five expected. zero. Oh, our Jonathan was talking about that zoom limiter. Let's see it. Looks like we're back up, getting some questions coming in again. Oh. Can those sea cucumbers detect light? And is that why they start swimming away? Um, not likely. No, I think they're probably detecting the flow of the current that, or the wake that the vehicle is pushing. That's interesting. Um, so I was just looking up the identity of this sponge here. You want to look at it? The one we I'll just passed up? Yeah. Um, cool. How long we got in this move? Uh, we've got 40 meters, but we can stop anytime you'd like. Can we take a piece of one of these sponges? It doesn't have to be this one right here, but if you're ready to take this oh, sponge. Oh, we're ready. Bridge, Nav. There was a question mark next to the name of this sponge. Hold position. Uh, possibly Circulophus hawaiicus. And uh, it looks a little odd. Um, since there's a question mark, I think it resembles a valuable collection to confirm its identity for this part of the line islands. So we don't need the whole sponge, maybe just a low um, and uh, it should be soft and squishy, so potentially a slurp candidate. Uh, Give me a sec, we're gonna push a few buttons up here to
change the jar over to. Yeah. Is this one going to be another snip and slurp? Uh, possibly. We'll, uh, we'll get a tight zoom there before we brutalize it. It actually looks different from Cercolophus from the main Hawaiian Islands. It looks a little different. This could be a different species. Can't really get a focus on it. Uh, can we try? Uh, I don't know what light where you're at. What light would reach it? How close the ROV is? More light on it. A little bit, yeah, possibly. Turn on the porch light. Go get more light. Is your porch light? I think you might have to cut it first. I don't think it's going to slurp up by itself. But we can try. Can we put this in jar four data? Yes, that works. Cool. Uh, you want to chomp a piece off? Yeah, I think you might have to cut a piece and then the cutter and then slurp it up. Roger. If it's too big, we can box it too. Well, we've we've seen many of these over the past uh, few or so. We could take the whole thing, but we just don't need to. Um, a piece of the the top of the sponge should be enough. Steve, why are we targeting this sponge again? You said there was a question mark. Yeah. So, um, looking at the Okeanos Explorer Animal ID guide, Tammy? which is uh, curated by or was curated by uh, biologists who are experts in the field of sponges and corals and things like that, uh, and all the animals that have been identified. And there's a question mark next to this name. Could be a species related to or the same as one that's found in the Hawaiian Islands. But since there's uncertainty around that, uh, it's best to get a piece of this to confirm because it's never been sampled in this area to the best of our knowledge. And it seems fairly characteristic and representative of this site, which is one of the goals to characterize the biology of the seafloor and the seamount. Uh, it's in the family Pheronomatidae. Uh, which is related to species called uh, Polyopagon, That's, uh, uh, which is common. How do you morphology. feel about that right there, Steve? Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. Just a big chunk of it. Grip force sponge. Good, good capture. Okay. Ready for stow? Oh, uh, sure. Put that down in the 
Did you get your still? Yep. Okay, I'm going to move the camera to the slurp. of collecting a sponge sample. about um, how they repair and continue okay. to grow after a piece is removed. Yeah, the, the, more? so the yeah, sponges are made up of uh, okay. largely of these That's spicules, 50. but they also have cells that live inside the matrix of the sponge, okay. and those cells will help secrete new spicules. They'll arrange themselves and start to regrow, um, theoretically, almost immediately. Um, Go in. There's been some experiments uh, that have been done yeah, on other types of sponges is. where they okay. yep, good sample. Where even after being um, essentially blended up uh, and run through a strainer, they can the cells will start to reform and start to regrow so the sponge according to their genetic memory. That's kind of cool. Yes. Yeah investigation there for sure, huh? what mechanism um, triggers that. Just pick up it's like a healing there. factor. Okay. Yeah, kind of like uh, Terminator 2, you know, the, the police officer. Mm -hmm. Was that and the like, liquid one? Yeah, he was made of liquid metal, <laughs> yeah. T-1000. T-1000. I'm curious, Steve, have you ever returned to a sampled site to uh, check out a specimen that's been sampled already. I'm gonna have to get that two knots um, there to make up some time. I'm gonna come yeah. right up and come underneath me. I think once, I, I was on a cruise once that we returned to a site in the Gulf of Mexico where we had done some sampling, but uh, I think at that particular site they had actually observed improvement of Zero portals uh, that were in the region of um, an area that had been severely impacted by the Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill. So a lot of the corals started off um, fairly, you know, fouled with, you know, like flocculent material, um, oil and dispersant chemicals and stuff. Um, and that they have, they were able in some cases to clear themselves over time. In other cases, they, they succumb to their damages. Can you zoom the four um, yeah. Uh, oh. What just happened, ROV? Don't know, didn't touch anything. That's what was happening on Argus Zeus yesterday. Uh, nope, that was just a monitor thing. Okay. Totally different thing. ROV, are we ready for a move? Roger. Thank you. Bridge nav. Okay, you're back in the box. It wasn't a monitor thing on Argus? yesterday wasn't happening in my recorders ah uh, okay. uh, turn off porch light as we're traversing a couple more questions are coming in how do sponge and coral associates find the right home in such a sparse environment do they arrive as larvae okay, or back. grow up? Yeah, with the sponges, um, I guess it's not that difficult. Uh, you know, they have lots of space here, but they must choose the place that they settle pretty carefully. They seem to be very deliberately located. Um, but I'm guessing it, yeah, the sponge larvae in this case probably uh, find a good spot in the sediment to lay down those uh, spicules, those roots, and then they'll grow up over time. But the corals, are a little bit more needy in terms of specific habitat requirements. So typically they need some sort of hard substrate to attach to. Um, 
there are some coral species that don't. They have, uh, you know, um, some types, some bamboo corals in the genus Echinella have the ability to anchor themselves using these kind of modified branches uh, into the sediment. Um, some black corals do that well as well in the bridge no? um, uh, species called uh, schizopathies, a genus called schizopathies, kind of anchors into the sediment using a, a hook-like thing. Um, but for the most part, most corals do require hard substrate, and that can be satisfied with something like a pebble, gravel, um, or you know, usually a large boulder. And then what about the associates? Yeah, the associates typically will seek out, um, I'm, I'm assuming in the larval stage, they'll usually seek out uh, a type of uh, coral and when they settled, settle down. Uh, on that coral, they'll grow up over time. Although there's always the chance that you know if it's not suitable, they can move. Um, but typically, you don't find associates moving around all that much. They're fairly static once they've uh, established on a colony. Do you think they're zooming in on chemical cues in the water? Uh, that's probably likely. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of. A lot of chemistry going on at the steps because uh, we assume it's not visual. Um, you know, most things out here, down here, are not looking at you know, light in the visible spectrum. They may be using other things like biofluorescence or um, other wavelengths that we're not familiar with. Bridge, no? Can you zoom on this little coral, Tammy? Oh yeah, what do you got there? Curious little sea pen, I think. Sea pen. The sea pen, dun dun dun. <laughs> Haunt Steve's nightmares. <laughs> yeah. I think this is a penatulid sea pen, so in the family Penatulidae, but uh, something like this has been sampled on previous cruises. In fact, I, I know this one from uh, wide, collections in Howland Baker Unit of Prim. Uh, last year we collected this, uh, so not going to go for a collection here, but good to note that it's the first one we really saw um, okay. after that rocky, rocky stretch. We'll, we'll uh, be able to look for this particular animal, for example, in our eDNA sample. Um, if we know, you know a bit about its genetic barcode, we can look for that barcode somewhere in the eDNA. So eDNA stands for environmental DNA. And uh, right. some of Steve's work is to characterize the diversity, coral diversity, using eDNA techniques. Yep. Yeah, a lot of really cool um, uses for eDNA these days. Uh, I was just reading a paper that came out a few days ago about um, eDNA use being used in place of um, fishing stock assessment surveys. So rather than going out twice a year and trawling for fishes to estimate their abundance and you know how much can be take, uh, taken for a year, you can use eDNA to uh, capture water from those regions, from those areas, do an estimate of stock, you know, how many fish are in the area, and then maybe set limits maybe one day without having to without kill having fish. To go out and kill yeah. Them. Yeah. But, I, you know, I would argue that even though we've known about this method for a while, it's still not widely used. Uh, but, yeah. In part because the, the costs are still high, but they're coming down very quickly to sequence, um, you know, sequence very deeply these environmental DNA samples. I'm kind of curious what the workflow looks like from Niskin bottle to the information you need. I can 
definitely share that with you. I have it written down somewhere. I'm just gonna make sure I'm doing, saying yeah, it right. Yeah, no. I just, I'm curious, you know? How do we get from water sample to an eDNA information that is valuable? can be interpreted to give us an indication about what's going on in terms of diversity. Greetings from Monterey Bay, California. Hello, Monterey Bay. Hello, Monterey Bay, and hello, George Matsumoto. Oh, <laughs> hello, George. <laughs> and Bari. And Bari, thank you for saying hi. George was instrumental in me getting into this field. Um, it was my first internship was at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute many, many moons ago went on my first ROV dive while I participated in an internship program run by George. So hello, Monterey Bay. And yes, it's great that I get to be out here and I'm still exploring. My first ROV cruise was also on the Western Flyer. Really? Where did you guys go out? Uh, sorry? Where, where did you go? Oh, um, this was actually when I was working for Monterey Bay Aquarium, doing social media, and uh, I talked to Jim Barry after a lecture that he gave at the aquarium one day, asking if they had considered ever doing social media on their cruises, because this was <laughs> early days, um, and so I was able to go out on an environmental impact assessment cruise that they had, it was like a four-day cruise going out to look at the Mars uh, deep sea observatory network that's out in the submarine canyon. So it was four days of push cores along <laughs> along the cable, and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Right. And it was the end of the season. Everyone was done, like exhausted and done. And uh, it was, you know, I, I was, it, you know, it was the first opportunity to do something like this, and um, we didn't have enough internet, and so it was mostly like live tweeting about the the dives. Um, and I just remember the pilot saying like, you know, it's a good reminder that what we're doing is really cool even when we're all burnt out and it's the end of the year and we're just taking push cores every 200 meters or whatever it was. <laughs> um, and now now being in that position where it's sometimes the end of the season and you're exhausted but you're excited to be able to share something with the world, it's kind of cool to be able to come full circle. That's awesome. So tell me what's your impression of push cores now? Yeah. <laughs> This bring bringing back uh, PTSD. Yeah. <laughs> well, at, at, you know, at the time it was like everyone was the first one. It was. <laughs> I love that. I remember yeah. that too with my first uh, Western Flyer trip. Oh my goodness, we got something coming in saying, "Yay, Samantha! Did you know that the RV Western Flyer is retiring this year?" I do. I've been hearing about it, almost retiring for many years. But yeah. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, and actually the original Western Flyer, which was the 
fishing vessel that uh, John Steinbeck and Ed Ricketts uh, chartered to go down to the Baja California um, and was featured in the book blog from the Sea of Cortez. It was getting restored currently in Port Townsend, Washington and has um, a scud hopefully will be in water and actually running educational programs out of Monterey Bay by the end of uh, 2023. What? Yeah, plank by plank, it's getting restored. It's pretty incredible if you check out Western Fire Foundation online. Okay, that's pretty cool. Definitely check that out, peeps. The original Western Fire. Yeah, so Did the- Did you say Monterey? It's gonna run out of Monterey? Yeah, it'll be down um, in Monterey half the, the- The goal is to have it in Monterey half the year, and then, um, and doing day trips uh, with students and uh, ideally an educator program as well. And then um, once programs are, are kind of settled in, also being able to go down to Baja and the Gulf of California, and then eventually up to Southeast Alaska as well, which was the original kind of range that Ed Ricketts That's had like been historical, writing about. <laughs> yeah. historical journey, I love Yeah, that. exactly. So, um, yeah, pretty exciting, exciting work going on. Um, and they also now have a partnership with the Naval Postgraduate School in uh, in Monterey, so strong oceanographic component as well. Oh, question for Sam. Uh, from one of our viewers, considering a mid-life career change, it seems like you've had quite a journey and many <laughs> roles. Um, how did you do it all? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, step by step, I guess. Um, I had I have a political science degree um, from the University of Chicago, and there was one marine biology class that I took. I got really excited by that, um, but didn't think that that was a path for me um, for some reason, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but that's okay because I found my way back. Um, Give me one second, let me put in a ship move. Yeah. Bridge, Nev. Five zero meters, zero five zero, please. Uh, and so we'd spend my summers working at Monterey Bay Aquarium doing uh, public programs. And uh, that led to meeting a submersible pilot who was um, really excited about education as well. And we started running open ROV, small ROV work, building workshops for students, and that led me to Nautilus and the Science Communication Fellowship. Um, I'd also run social media at Monterey Bay Aquarium, and so I guess my, my advice to anyone who's considering a mid-career or even mid-academic switch is to just find peripheral opportunities in a field that you're interested in. So if, if you know, I, I didn't have the science background, but I found other opportunities to be involved and then was able to build um, skills through kind of on the job, on the fly opportunities. And especially when you're in a workplace like Nautilus, you really can um, kind of shadow other people and develop an understanding of what roles are out there. I certainly had no idea that this that, that there were so many roles um, involved in, in being at sea for deep sea exploration. And so I'd always been fascinated by it um, and had been really inspired by Mbari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute growing up. I remember going to like open houses and um, meeting some of the researchers and seeing the test tank for ROVs, sure. um, but but didn't realize there were so many roles that were not uh, specifically academic science or engineering based. So my advice is find a field that you're interested in and find any opportunity to get involved. And once your foot's in the door, it can be a lot easier to to figure out what to do next. But step by step, that was a long answer. Oh, that was a great answer, because it's real, step by step. Yeah, I'd say it's a lot uh, okay. easier, to, well, I feel like the inclination that I have and that many others have is to try to plan ahead and see the end goal, but in many ways it's um, sometimes easier to just take that first step, find the next best thing for you at the, at the time. Gotcha. my experience every everything i've engaged in because i was curious about like has led to something else 
Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, definitely when you do find opportunities yeah. or ask for opportunities, definitely stay in touch okay. with the people who provided you opportunities or mentored you or even were, were colleagues because right. that's also um, huge. Right. It's not necessarily who you know up the chain, it's it's colleagues and, and that network that you start to build. Tammy, um, do you want to zoom in? I'll turn on porch light. Oh, it's a bit cool. Thanks muddy. for sharing, Samantha. Yeah. Great questions coming in today. Every day. Great questions always coming in. Where are we? Okay, I can get off the move now. Come wide, please. So, Steve, it seems like we've been seeing a lot of these sponges. Yeah, that have quite a lot of associates. Do you think this is because that they're the only structure for quite some distance around? That that seems like a reasonable assumption. Yeah, it's not any port in a storm, I guess. Yeah, except Palmyra. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon, Steve. Too soon. <laughs> I'm surprised we're not seeing any bioturbation evidence of critters. Oh, right as I said that. And there, there we have it. Perfect. <laughs> there, yeah, there's there's little bumps around. So these little mounds, molehills, you know, uh, those are uh, holes where there was presumably some sort of uh, in fauna at one point. They don't look particularly fresh. Um, fresh meaning, you know, fresh sand, right. sediment. Usually things are older when they've acquired some of this uh, phytodetritus, this kind of dark patches. It's probably you know, marine snow that's accumulated in certain spots. You use the word bioturbation. What does that mean? That is the... Um, Disturbance of the sediment by biology, uh, either living inside the sediments, called infauna, or uh, on the surface of the sediments. Nice picture. Yeah. yeah. Still, Kem's getting a workout today and yesterday. I, w I found 13 just in a really kind of cursory overview of 13 really great photos from the dive yesterday. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's really a good very candidates. high percentage. Yeah. Well, 13 out of 3,000. <laughs> <laughs> Still, it sounds a lot higher than normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, you know, having having some extra hands back here uh, to run the still cam is the better way to run it. Um, but, yeah. Viewer um, writing in from British Columbia. He's been watching all night. Wanted to know if we're heading to any more rock outcrops, and how many more hours do we think we have left in this dive? BC, so, go Canucks. Uh, how many more hours? Um, so we're scheduled to be off the bottom at 4 p.m. Or well, I'm back on deck rather at 4 p.m. So that would put us off bottom sometime around. Uh, sometime in the next six or seven hours, um, but uh, we kind of are working on an amended dive plan, dive track today, and that puts us a lot closer to our end waypoint, uh, which is around waypoint 10 or so, uh, which is how far away? Uh, from waypoint 10? Yeah. 800 meters. Yeah, Steve, I had actually calculated that time before, but... um. We got busy. Mm. So let me get that revised time for you. So depending on um, how this goes, the, we could be looking at maybe 12 o'clock or 4 o'clock, sometime between there on deck. And then are we currently wow, in transit to another outcrop? Yeah, so uh, we are about to start climbing another rise, it looks like, on our bathymetry. Um, 
haven't seen anything on sonar yet resembling kind of hard substrate targets chased down, but um, I suspect we'll see some pretty soon, maybe in the next move or two. So Steve, uh, if we're going 0 0.2 knots to waypoint 10 from here, it's about two hours. Okay. All right. Let's see what we can do. Shout out for that math and for all of my seventh grade math students that called in for my interaction yesterday. Calculations are key. when it comes to bioturbation and the animals that are living in the sediments, can you identify the type of animal by looking at the mound in the sediments? Ooh, what's that? That looks different. Yeah, this is another fer uh, nomadid sponge. likely in the genus Cericolophus. Uh, it's the same one we sampled as far as we know. Okay. There seems to be some indication uh, from some imagery I was looking at that the sponge that looks like this from sampled, maybe sampled, question mark, from uh, Howland and Baker in 2017 on a cruise I was on might have actually been a new species. At least it says that. So it could be undergoing a uh, new species description right now. Uh, but I haven't seen any development on that. So I'll keep tabs on that. And then we can use that to compare this material as well. There's some indication that it might be resembling of a similar species uh, close to Hawaii. But you know we're also close enough. We're, we're probably about equidistant from Hawaii and Helen Baker. Where is Helen Baker? Uh, it would be west of us. Yeah, about a thousand <laughs> miles. Yeah. A thousand miles? Yeah. I'm pointing like I know where west is. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Let's see, is that right? Actually, that's actually, that's actually right. <laughs> kind of northwest. Yeah, the context. It's actually more like, you know, like southwest. <laughs> Mostly west, but a little bit south. It's so like when Tammy asked me where the uh, emergency site is on the boat, somewhere <laughs> out the Up, side. <laughs> upwards. So maybe species to be determined of the sponge. In fact, there is a, well, what is left of a lighthouse on Howland, where uh, Amelia Earhart, she that was her last stop before she went missing. Oh, that's kind of cool. I recently watched a documentary that came out a couple, was it, I don't know, in the COVID <laughs> years. Was it the Nautilus documentary? I think so, yeah. 2019. 2019. Wow, this feels like it was so long ago. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Different time. So is this the same sea star, but without the um, tubes inflated? Uh, maybe. It might be different, actually. This one actually looks like in a kind of third. Some okay. different family.
Not moving, though. <laughs> We're going to let the ROVs catch up before putting in another step. <laughs> yeah? Oh. Okay. I've got a viewer checking out channel three of the feed and very excited about the setup. Um, so what you're seeing is our control room, and this is where we are all operating from right now. So the first row in the control room includes a station for our navigator and our ROV pilots, as well as for our video engineer. And the second row in the control room includes stations for our scientists, as well as the science communication or the communication desk which I'm at right now. So that's what you see. Oh, we're waving. Say hello. <laughs> Are we all waving? <laughs> oh, and one, two, three, wave. Oh, good coordination. <laughs> we'll let Antonella keep her hand nice. on the RV. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> important. Oh, that's important. I, oh. I find it flies much better when I don't have my hands Oh, on. really? <laughs> <laughs> no hands. We're gonna need our coordination when we have to do our dance moves on tour. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Is and that a snail egg case? Yeah, we can take a look at that if you have time. It's just out of the bottom of the screen. Can you circle that for me, Steve? Yeah. Uh, Sorry, back down for it. This way. Okay. That's a possibility, but it can be any, any amount of debris, too. We were seeing something that looked like this uh, a bit deeper. Thought it was a sponge, maybe. But yeah, there's sometimes there are egg cases that look like this, ribbons of sediment covered. Uh, I don't even know what, what a good form Go for that is. Sediment covered something. Could also be a shell. I like sponge. Uh. It, uh, it does look kind of spongy, it's huh? It's more spongy, yeah. Bundles of fibers, yeah. I think what we're looking at is the backside of like one of these like satellite dish sponges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just has a massive hole blown through it. All right, thanks. Thanks for uh, noting that hole in it, Steve. <laughs> it was hard to I see. Need to yeah. differentiate <laughs> something that's naturally occurring to something that is uh, probably uh -huh. uh, not supposed to be there. Um, a question coming in for Dan and Antonella. How are the ROVs cleaned and scrubbed down between dives? Stand by. Um, can you repeat that? Oh. Mm -hmm. How are the ROVs uh, cleaned and scrubbed down in between dives? Um, yeah, so after every single dive, we rinse both the ROVs really well with fresh water don't really do scrub downs after each dive because oftentimes we're just you know getting the corroding salt water off and then um, putting it right back in the water fairly soon usually we'll give it a nice pressure wash with soap um, after every cruise or anytime the vehicles are going to be sitting for a while so that there isn't any salt that's going to be corroding things um, but yeah just a nice fresh fresh water rinse on the whole vehicle is what we do nice do you ever get any biofouling on the ROV? Do animals try and settle and grow on the ROV? Um, I mean, not in the sense of like biofouling that occurs from being in, a, in the water for a long time. Like, like I've seen that on you know camera systems and moorings where you know it's just there and it becomes a habitat. The ROVs are always on the move. There's you know flow over them and and they're not. Even when they're in the water for you know multiple days, there's not really enough time, as far as I'm aware, for things to sort of start growing. Um, we get, I don't think you'd call it biofouling, but we do have, you know, bit as Dan was saying earlier, you know, stuff comes up on the ROV sometimes, like fish that have sort of run into it by accident. It's not really the, what I would call biofouling. That's the su surprise samples. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> surprise samples. Makes sense. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Sometimes the scientists don't clean out their bio boxes, especially after we've picked up whale bits or slimy Ooh. stuff. We have to deal with that. <laughs> Usually they're pretty good about it, though. My gosh. 
well falls. Now I'm thinking about what's the stinkiest thing you've ever <laughs> collected. That's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good question. The whole boat knows it. <laughs> yeah. For days. <laughs> the lab is just awesome. I, I, I've been told that the stinkiest thing we've ever collected was the whale, uh, whale bones from 20... 19, was it? Yeah. Monterey Bay? Yeah. Yeah. But we went back in 2020 and we resampled, and I didn't think they had very much of a smell at all. Oh, well, it's because they were far more decomposed by then. Yeah. <laughs> Let's goop. Oh, is it goopy? Yeah, it I guess so. <laughs> they were not goopy. I can attest to that in 2020. They were very spongy, actually. Bones were very porous and they were being dissolved and eaten from the inside by the uh, bone eating worms. Yeah, the first time there was still plenty of flesh. Yeah. Can we zoom here? Ooh. And there's a little pink dot. Oh, sea spider. Uh oh. No, Oof. pink dot first. <laughs> <laughs> we must stop at sea spider too, because we are the arachnophobe band. Yeah, that's true. We can get the fish in this, in this pink dot in the same shot. Okay. Just settle down. Really get it signed up. Okay. Go ahead and zoom. Oh, wow. Very nice. I haven't seen one this, this one in a while. This is actually an amazing shot of a cup coral. And I know this one to family because the shape is very, very obvious. It's in the family Flabellidae, may even be Flabellum. Um, it has a very wide, uh, kind of elongate morphology. Uh, but I don't think that one's been seen in this area. It's a good observation. I think that was a, I think that was a good enough shot. Um, I we can really try can't. And line it up again. Yeah, if, if you want to, if you have time. Oh, my, please. The ship just completed a move, so we can keep going, or we can admire yeah, longer. Yeah, yeah, we can we can take a look at the sea spider if we want to. Sea also. spider, yay! Okay. Uh, I haven't seen flabellum in this area, and this one's really obvious. Um, what feature made it like the boom? Fish. That's it. The, it's Sorry. elongate, the so it's not circular. Cup. Yeah, not a circular cup. But there are there are many other species in the in the family Flabellidae too. But if we were to look at it from the side, it would kind of look fan shaped. Okay. See so if you can get 4K centered on it, and I'll move the camera. Sure. But 4K is not recorded anywhere. Yeah. So if he's trying to get it for ID, you need it not in 4K. Roger. Uh, it's just to your left. There it is, right there in 4K. Crawling around your food. Turn your nose into the breeze. Easy. It's uh, zoomed in, so you're Looks like you're bouncing. There you are. Yeah, so this is this is almost definitely a flabellid. Could you turn off porch light once? 
just so I could see. Stick locks on. So, Steve, uh, how are they attached through the substrate? Very good question. And um, in this case, they actually might not be. There's actually a number of cup corals that are sediment dwellers. Um, you know, they have a big, it kind of looks like a, a ram's horn shaped, uh, you know, bottom of the, the cup where they're just kind of hooked into the sediment a little bit. I don't know how they maintain, like, getting smothered, you know, not getting smothered. Um, so it's it's very interesting how they've adapted to that kind of existence, but... Should I look at the sea spider? Or? Yeah, yeah, you can look at the sea spider if you have time. Um, yeah, we, we, have can, time. we can be off. So cup corals are always high priority collections, but we're not going to collect this one since it's only one, and it's very difficult to collect uh, parts of parts of them. So uh, if we do see more than ten or so, we would definitely want a collection from this area. I wonder if this sea spider is predating on something. It looks. Uh, Curiously perched over this uh, area of bioturbation. Maybe there's something in the sediment it's digging for. Does Does it? Go Does ahead. I was going to say it looks like it has a lot of legs. Is that just me? Let's or is it look. shadow? I think it's a shadow. Is that another dinner plate size spider? Certainly pretty big. It's 20 centimeters, something like this or so. Yeah. Oh, okay. Still got a little chill. <laughs> Thinking about that camera. thing. If you want to zoom on the 4K, Dan. Uh. <laughs> Two of them there. Yep. Yeah. Oh huh. my. <laughs> Lots of legs. Lots of legs. See, there's two of them? Yep. Yeah. Wait, what? Yeah. Are They're we interrupting? They're stacked. I think we're interrupting. So you um, <laughs> did see lots of legs there. Yeah. Or are they cannibalistic? Uh. <laughs> it's hard to read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Imagine how they feel. <laughs> mixed do mixed I messages. Eat it? Do I eat it or do I reproduce with it? Interesting. I feel like I want to search this, but I also don't want this in a search history. <laughs> and also, <laughs> I don't know what's going to come up. Uh, so I'm trying to find which end is <laughs> uh, showing here. The one underneath. They have the proboscis, right? Like, I don't know. What is yeah, that's, it, it's still a little murky. I'm just waiting for the sediment to clear a bit. But it's... Uh, uh, you can see in the upper left corner of the 4K. So I think the bottom one is facing towards us. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the 4K, yeah. It's actually a better shot. Um, but maybe... Maybe the one on top is facing away from us. I think the one on the bottom is upside down, or no? No, the legs are all growing the same way. Yeah, this, this is... This might be reproduction here, huh? Yeah, based on the uh, Dr. Google. <laughs> looking, looking like that's what it is. Hmm. Sea spiders mate by using the genital pores in their legs. The male sea spider climbs onto the female, and the pair adjusts until the pores are aligned. I think uh, there's something in, yeah, it looks like there's some sort of white material in one of the um, appendages of one of the, uh, of the bottom one. I'm not quite sure. Rather than muck up the shot uh, anymore, trying to maneuver to get a better close-up, I think. I'll just call this a good documentation of this event. Has this been documented before? We'll find out. Is that full zoom, is it, Tammy? Yeah, that's full I know, zoom. Um, it's definitely something we'll have to reach out to specialists about. 
but great, great, yeah. Very nice observation. Apologies, sea spiders. We oh, didn't mean to enjoy Before you click that button, see how much uh, down you have right now, about 20%. So put in a little bit. what you think is going to be 20%, then click the button and slowly let off. I didn't know that was the objective. I have to back down. Steve, anything else you wanted to look at here, or? Let's make the tracks. Okay. Okay. We'll do Come one on, short move before our watch ends. Bridge nav. Two zero meters, zero five zero. So, um, if we were, so what's the what would the ascent rate and time look like if we were to leave bottom around thirteen fifty meters? What would we do? Twenty meters per minute, or would we do slower? Uh. Pilots are busy right now. We can calculate it with 20 meters and then let you know if they have a different change. I don't know how heavy the rocks are that we brought on. Oh, yeah. But we haven't dropped any plates yet, so. Okay. That would be 67 minutes. Okay. Question for Team Science, would you characterize the sediment in this area as sandy or muddy? Um, it definitely has the appearance of being muddy when we're zooming around like this. It's easy to stir up kind of the, the sur very surface layer, uh, which is loosely compacted, probably phytodetritus and marine snow, plant okay. debris, you know, you can, algae. Uh, you can look at the bubble camera here on the front of the vehicle and see the mud that's yeah. just on the black bumper there. Yeah. But um, a lot of the sediments on these seamounts are actually very, very fine uh, grains of uh, shells of animals, very fine uh, foraminiferan shells. Uh, we have some drying down in the lab if you want to come take a look. Uh, but basically, yeah, just very, very fine, you know, almost gr sand grain sized uh, shells. Oh wow, I'm definitely gonna check it out, take some pictures. Do we see different type of biology depending on muddy versus sandy sediments? Does that ha have an impact on the type of life that we see? Um, I, I presume it would. Yeah. Um, the I sediments in, in the seamounts are remarkably similar. I mean, you would probably have finer grain material the deeper you go, uh, you know, and probably more coarse grain material in areas where there's high current scour, um, like rocks or rocky knolls and things. And, uh, something make a dust off to your left there. It's not you. Dunk, dunk, dunk. See it in mm. there? Something rocking What right is here? that? That's the phrase that uh, precipitates all interesting things. Or is it your own settlement cloud? Oh. Something moving up there. Ship just completed a move, so we've got some Roger. space. And uh, the next watch is coming up. Let's 
pretty big settlement cloud. Are right. we gonna hold or do another move? Uh, we can move. Yeah. See. Maybe it was my imagination. That's good enough. So there's uh, a lateral. The cloud is blowing that way. Maybe it was my cloud. Maybe. This is supposed to be pretty steep here. There's no indication on sonar of anything hard coming up in the immediate. Nope. Yeah. Okay, do we want to put in a move or just hold here for the next okay. watch? We can move. We, we can do it on, on the fly. Uh, change over, Sam. Bridge nav. Five zero meter zero five zero. All right, there, viewers. We are coming into the end of our watch, but thank you so much for joining us. Delta Dan and the Arachnophobe Band is going to be signing off pretty soon. And again, you um, were with us as we explored an unnamed and unexplored seamount north of Kingman Reef. Really quick, Starting what, at what death. Exactly, am I zooming in on uh, the little guy that was looked like a snail or something? But it's fine. Okay. And moving up to the top, trying to get to the top at approximately 1,300 meters, looking for geological and biological features to help us better stand this area. Thank you so much, and hope you enjoy the next watch. Mr. Fish.
All right, team. So what we're going to do is uh, try to move along to waypoint 10. It'll get a little steep before we get there, but uh, on the flat part, we'd like to move along at somewhere around you know, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 knots if possible. And then that'll give us extra time to explore that next terrace, the, the steep area there. And then um, once we get to this, you know, we'll su we should have time if we can do move that speed. We should have time to reach the summit and start uh, leave the seafloor around 11:30 for a 1300 on deck. All right, sounds good. Um, we just finished our, our move. I'm thinking we might want to head towards this uh, red square here. What do you think? That sounds fine. Yeah. Red usually means interesting yeah. when it comes to slope. Slope. <laughs> All right. Let's get going. Yeah. Bridge nav. A bunch of Siri Colopus around here. So those are uh, sponges that root in the sediment. So all these, there's one live sponge and there's a bunch of dead yep. sponge stalks. Oh, fish. No, no, we're not going to no. tow. We're just going to meander quickly. Oh, yeah. Oh, ah. I see. That's interesting. Popped out. I can drive to the end and see. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. We could uh, we could try that on the transit across this uh, flat part up here. So try for a, a knot or two. Do you want to come off the bottom a little bit to do that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. You can do it. All right, I want to come around. Hey, right, Jamie. So what we're doing is uh, going to uh, move a little bit faster along this next stretch of seafloor so that we can uh, put some tension on the tether and pull out a little uh, loose area there where the. Uh, the daisy chain that we use to attach the lift above? line to the tether, there's a little loose area there. <coughs> that should disappear as we tow the vehicles at a, you know, somewhere between one and two knots. Uh, and it'll get us to this next, beginning of the next terrace uh, near the summit of the guillo. So what is a guillo exactly? A guillo is a flat-topped sea mount, a table mount that was eroded by wave, wind, rain, when it was when the sea mount was above the surface, when it was an island. There are some flat-topped sea mounts that are formed by other processes. Some some types of volcanic activity can result in a flat surface, but uh, most of the guillos are were islands that have sunk. I know. I'm just gonna go as the. Uh, as the volcanic feature moves away from the hot spot that formed it, it cools, the crust cools and subsides, and the uh, the flattened top eventually sinks beneath the surface. For a while, it may be a um, in an atoll okay. with a fringing reef around the edge, and then, but eventually, the subsidence will bring that those corals 
too far beneath the surface to keep growing and so you'll, you're left with this seamount that's got a kind of a carbonate cap at the top yep. coming up ancient you know d uh, eroded coral and a flat top and are there uh, particularly interesting things we can find on these on the geodes on the that geos. maybe at the else? summit it's it's probably often sedimented and so there could be some you know interesting invertebrates that would be buried in the sediment hard to spot from an rov uh, but there are some unique sp species that are unique to uh, geos uh, i'm not up to speed on them all but they were named by admiral harry hess and uh, who uh, mapped many of them in world war ii he was uh, a professor of geology at Princeton University, served in the Pacific, and would leave the uh, fathometer running on his uh, ship as he transited uh, from island to island in support of Admiral Nimitz's island hopping campaign. But uh, he saw lots and lots of geos named after the, uh, well, the academic building, the geology uh, building at Princeton U, but that in turn was named after, uh, I believe, a French geologist. But I have to double check on that. I love when it ties back to New Jersey. <laughs> so this is the 8 to 12 watch. We've just switched over. A quick round of introductions. My name is Jamie Zachariah. I'm serving as comms lead today. Emil Petroncio, watch lead. Coralie Rodriguez, sitting in the science seat. Hi, everyone. This is Leilani Saban, Azure Data Logger. In your front row, this is Megan Petz, the navigator. Uh, Jake Bonney, sitting in the Herc seat right now. Mike's not on, Bob. Still not on SPL. Bob uh, Waters sitting in the Argus seat. <laughs> Third, Third time's time. a charm. Yeah. <laughs> Dave Robertson, video engineer. So we are exploring this unnamed geo about 32 meters north of Kingman Reef. Nautical miles. Nautical miles. I read that too fast. <laughs> So we did map this area, right? Yep, yep. We collected some data over it. Uh, mapping team turned it around and in support of the dive planning. I think we're, we're set up, right? We're ready. Uh, and then why did we select this site data? to dive on? Uh, 50, 55 meters off bottom? Yeah, I thought we were going 100. Okay. 100. It was an interesting uh, set of marine terraces, uh, or you know, possibly the edges of uh, former atolls uh, at a couple different depths here. We explored the first one during our 8 to 12 watch last night. Uh, it's some, some rocky features, some, some big boulders, and, but not a lot of uh, biology. <laughs> it must not be a very productive area at the surface, so there's not enough marine snow or not enough flux of nutrients past the filter feeders, but there have been a some sponges, some corals, and uh, I think the excitement on the uh, zero, the midnight to four watch was uh, Cerianthus. That was attached to a rock. Normally they're on the in the sediment, but uh, this was one of those that can jump away and swim. And they sampled it. They were able to snip it, and they did catch the first video ever of one of these. Uh, moving through the water column. That's very awesome. exciting. I can't wait to take a look at that. Yeah, I look forward to seeing that. So to put some tension on this tether and daisy chain, we're, vehicles have come up off the seafloor so we can move more safely along the bottom.
Okay, I think we can start moving. So you're actually 50 meters above Argus, is that right? No. Herc? No. That is not right. Looks like Herc, oh, Herc altitude might not be accurate, huh? Yeah, it's, it's only accurate to um, about 80 meters. So. Okay. Argus's altimeter only works down at you know below thirty. Uh, okay. 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 They get stopped there, Jake. We're still within altimeter range. If the occasional Doppler hits. Yeah. So bottom, like yeah. 80. And Nav, could you uh, pass to the bridge? I'm not sure if they got the word that we're planning to recover it. Uh, 1300 now. Vice 1300? Yep, Vice 16. So that uh, Harry Hess uh, contributed to the uh, plate tectonics revolution, the revolution in our understanding of how the tectonic plates move around. The, uh, so he didn't have a lot of data to support his idea of seafloor spreading, but it made sense with what he observed with islands and atolls and geos. And, uh, but once we started getting that the data on the magnetic reversals on either side of spreading ridges that started to add up. And uh, the idea of new ocean crust being created at, sp at ridges, at spreading centers, and then being recycled at subduction zones started to come into place in the mid to late 60s. Someone instrumental in that was uh, Mary Tharp who was a woman in STEM and a cartographer, I believe. And uh, she started mapping the seafloor for these other two geologists. And um, when she saw that, she like noticed these spreading centers, she tried to tell them about them and they totally dismissed her and called it woman's talk. And um, they ended up winning awards for <laughs> discovering spreading centers later on. Yeah, Maurice Ewing was the head of Lamont Doherty uh, Earth Observatory at the time under Columbia University, and uh, Bruce Van Heesen was Mary's supervisor. And yeah, they very painstaking work to s to put together these few transects, but she kept seeing that notch, that rift valley in this in the Mid Atlantic Ridge. Yeah. And if you're interested in learning more about Marie Tharp, there's a really good book uh, called Soundings by I want to say the author's name is Hallie Felt. Is that the children's book? Because there's also a children's book. Oh, there's also book. a children's book. I forgot okay. what it is, but we have it on board, actually. I was just reading it the last time I came out because I was talking about Marie Tharp, and um, someone was like, oh, you know, they have a children's book about it. It's actually really interesting, and it's a fold-out, so you can, like, fold out all of the pages. So well, I know what I'll be doing after watch today. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I believe there's a project uh, to put together. We, at Dorian A 133, 134, we recorded uh, various members of the watch teams read portions of the book. Oh, and wow. And we got that on video. Go ahead, and So somebody's stitching it together. Um, so make sure you follow us on all of our social channels so when we release that, it'll be fun. Yeah, and so what finally uh, convinced people is uh, Jacques Cousteau towed a camera over the Mid-Atlantic 
Rift Valley. He didn't expect it to exist. Yeah. And uh, that <laughs> video confirmed it. Yeah, he went to kind of disapprove it, be like, oh, this isn't real. Ended up discovering that it was real. Yeah, so that was another important part of the puzzle. It always amazes me how these theories that we learn of that talk about eons really only came to be accepted within a short period of time ago. Yeah, when you get the right technology, uh, enough observations, multiple lines of evidence, mm -hmm. things happen. Minds get changed. Science is not a fast process, but it is a fascinating one. <laughs> The ocean drilling program also contributed to that understanding, taking these deep cores and dating the seeing increasing increasing age with distance from the spreading centers. What was the name of Jacques Cousteau's TV show? Yeah, what was that? That was really popular when I was young. Everybody watched that. Everybody was into the ocean. <laughs> something like the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau, or yeah. something like yeah. that. Yeah, I exactly believe that's right. right. Yeah. yeah, I was uh, an avid viewer. Yeah, of that. my father it was wrote a that very kind of popular documentary show. stuff. Yeah. Then I went to uh, I went to a movie theater uh, to watch some movie when I was about ten or so, and one of the shorts before it was called World Without Sun. Which I thought, oh, that must be a science fiction flick. Uh, nope. It was about <laughs> Alvin. Really? Yeah. Wow. wow. Huh. A movie in the, that's probably, I was about 10, mid 60s, and uh, called World Without Sun, and it was a short doc. Uh, Jacques Cousteau. Not Jacques Cousteau, but uh, about, about Alvin. Sure. Which I found fascinating as well. I was very into scuba diving when I was young. I got certified at for my 15th birthday. Oh, wow. Huh. My dad was worried I was going to drown myself. So <laughs> <laughs> I was taking a Sears air compressor and just sticking the hose in my mouth and letting the bubbles come out. <laughs> Not very safe. <laughs> I could actually go down until the air compressor ran out of air. <laughs> he decided it would be better if I learned how to do it right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but I never thought about you know, going into the, the deep sea exploration world. And I, I was an electronics engineer at a defense contractor in San Diego and was reading the EE e. Times. And in the back, they had a, a job advertisement for Alvin. And I said, what? <laughs> 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 and I put in for it. And then disappointingly, I didn't hear anything back. <laughs> but a year later, they just called me out of the blue and said, hey, the ship's in San Diego. Can you come down and interview? And I went down and interviewed, and they say, "Can you start Monday?" And like all of a sudden, just <laughs> took off. I was on the ship. <laughs> wow. So, for those of us who might not know Alvin's full history, does someone want to give a little summary of of the importance of Alvin? <laughs> I well. think it was 1963 when they first commissioned it. I believe. 63 or 64? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And so it was a Navy project, and what, what was the Admiral? Oh, I don't remember. Oh, anyway, yeah, the Navy commissioned it, and then it was built by General Mills, believe it or the not. The cereal company? Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I heard about them doing, like, it, manipulator it, arms, but I didn't know they did. Like yeah, Alvin. the first Alvin. manipulator arm had chains that operated it. Oh, it was very gangly. <laughs> Were they had, decorated like Fruit Loops? <laughs> I, did, I don't think they did, but the, <laughs> in the name Alvin, there's speculation whether it was Alvin the Chipmunk who oh, inspired I, it or Alan Vine, who yeah. was a, uh, a researcher at Woods Hole. But 
Alan Vine, yeah. Yeah. So it's been continuously updated through the years, through the 50 plus years it's been operating. And, uh, is it 50 plus? I think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So its latest iteration is it going to be able to dive to 6,500 meters. Oh, wow. And, and I, I've, I've been there three times, I think, as Alvin employee, and they want me to come back as a casual employee and help train some of their people, and I might be able to do the 6,500 meter uh, certification dive. Oh. Where do you that think that will cool. be? That's in the Puerto Rican Trench. Mm. So I'm hoping that I get to You'd do that. You'd be the deepest diving <laughs> Alvin pilot. <laughs> <laughs> well, there'll be a couple of us in there, but yeah, yeah, yeah. the certification dive will be with two Alvin people and a and a Navy uh, certification engineer. How's that tether looking? Looks good. Yeah. How much longer we got? Uh, we just completed our move. Okay. I'm gonna settle back down. So hopefully that stays out when we come down. Just curious, so how big a step did you do to make that happen? I did a 200 meter step. All right. So that how got us. How far back are we? We are. It's like about 150, yeah. 200. 150 Can you meters. Zoom out on the. Yeah. Okay. We'll just stay here for a yeah. moment. <laughs> His bottom's already coming up. Yeah, if it starts to get towards 30, maybe we have to come up a little more. All right. Before we settle out. Yeah. So that gives us about 200 meters of uh, the sand flat, and then we'll be into hopefully more interesting uh, terrain. To, you can let it'll. Okay. Argus will come in quicker if you're not yanking on it. I usually go by the sonar, like just get it within the, in between the, the uh, second and third ring there. <laughs> Have they made, I imagine they've made improvements to the battery on Alvin over the years. Well, many. yeah, not many, because it has lead-acid batteries, and um, they actually were stopping manufacturing them. They were used in, in uh, forklifts, but we, they can't switch over to using something like lithium batteries because of the danger of fire. Get too hot. Yeah, yeah they're, you know, they're too unstable. Mm -hmm. so the Navy actually was, was building a submersible with lithium batteries and it caught fire and the whole building that it was in burnt down because oh of no it. my goodness so <laughs> yeah so it's sticking with lead acid yeah so the endurance is about the same then it's that it's yeah I mean there isn't much improvement in lead acid battery technology since you know like 1900 or something. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're they're monitoring him better and yeah and trying to cut down on power usage, you know, things that are more efficient. But oh. <laughs> So I think it was Alvin that got wedged in the Mid-Atlantic Rift. 
uh, or another submersible. I don't recall. It was it was doing that exploration of it where they were getting narrower, narrower. Yeah, you got to watch out for that. <laughs> that was, sounds terrifying. <laughs> I was actually up in Endeavor doing a training dive, and the, actually the the current Alvin operations manager was a pilot in training. He was he was driving, and he bumped against the wall there, and a 900-pound rock went oh. kunk right on oh, the top of the science basket oh, <laughs> and pinned us to the bottom. Whoa. <laughs> That was a little, it's a little hairy. <laughs> <laughs> so I was able to push it off, but the science basket, a lot of things on Alvin can be pitched. You can, you can blow bolts detach, to eject. just detach them. Yeah. So things like thrusters that can get entangled in lines can be released, hmm. and and those big batteries can be dropped out. Oh. And the sub will run on. Emergency backup batteries are about shoebox size, and there's three of those inside that'll run the life support and all the releases to get you back to the surface. So, well, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of fuel suits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Always good to have your backup. So plans. several thousand pounds of of things can be jettisoned to get you back up. Not but unlike a red-footed booby trying to lighten its load. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So the original Alvin design, you could actually release the personnel sphere from the rest of the submarine. We want to come up a bit. Huh. But uh, that would be unstable. You know, it would be a, a ball yeah. that would flip over and over, and oh. yeah, it would be yeah, a hell of a ride. Yeah, that would not be pleasant. <laughs> wow. Getting down there. Oh, yeah. Let's go. I got it. One of our viewers is act asking about uh, sea quakes and whether anyone here has experienced them firsthand, whether Nautilus has. Uh, I don't think Nautilus has. I've never heard of it affecting our operations. There are, you know, most volcanoes in the world are under the ocean, thousands of earthquakes uh, along the subduction zones and near hot spots. Uh, a tsunami generated in deep water, though, wouldn't move the water column very much. half meter or meter even for a big what ends up being a big tsunami is not very large hmm. and the deep ocean so not something we really worry about no no I guess uh, you want to keep your distance from an <laughs> erupting volcano if you're <laughs> studying one but uh, the seismic activity wouldn't be a huge concern If there were a large release of methane or something like that from a turbidity flow or in a land, uh, underwater landslide, uh, a large methane release could affect the buoyancy of a ship. Could be a problem. But it'd have to be a big bubble up. You'd probably only see that along the continental margin.
Were there any issues with tension at, uh, in your pass down, Bob? Any concerns? Uh, we didn't hear any, any complaints about yeah. tension. But no news is good news, I guess. Yeah. It's pretty reasonable right now, so. All right, I'll start going down. Bob. Okay. Looks like our depth is 1579, just about 1580. Good now, right? It does. Yeah. Okay, that worked. Yep. Nice. Well right. done. Are we ready for a move? Uh, Let's get going. Out. All right. Bridge now. Can we make a 50 meter move, 0, 060 0 at 0.5 knots? So, Data, how are the uh, bio boxes, uh, the starboard and forward boxes looking? We got room for samples? Yeah, we have a bit of room. Starboard D is available. That's the only MT1. Um, but F probably has space um, for one I'd more. I'd like rock. to reset your DVL when you're ready. I think we already have five rocks. Good. Yeah. One, two, oh, yeah. Three, four. Yep, five rocks. How about Niskins? We have four more Niskins left. Only two samples were taken so far. All right. And three more um, flush jars. Got it. So what are these wavy patterns we can see in the sediment? Oh, those are uh, trails left probably from sea cucumbers. They meander quite randomly across the seafloor. Did see one very straight one last night. Yeah, that was <laughs> very dead on. Somebody had a good inertial navigation system. <laughs> This little thing in front of us is a sponge called Sericolophus. It's in the family um, Phaeronomatidae. And this sponge has long spicules or glass pieces that root into the sediment. They snipped a piece of one last watch. Um, so it looks like Sericolophus. 
Saracolophus hawaiicus. There was a question mark next to it in the uh, identification guide, so. Yeah, yeah, so those ones are usually found around Hawaii, and since we're not quite there, it's probably best to have the uh, question mark. There are a couple different ones. Uh, we don't know too much about them, but they kind of look like a, like a mitt, catcher's yeah. mitt. Yep. So Chris Kelly would always call them the catcher's mitt sponge. Yeah, there's quite a few of them out here. Yeah, they can grow in, you know, quite dense gardens. At least around Hawaii. Hmm. So that looked like a s dead sponge stalk. Yeah, so there's a bunch of like the Syracolophus stalks that have stayed up behind, but they've lost their heads. So you see these very long spicules are just really long pieces of glass. There's a little sea pen. Leilani, have they collected any sea pens during this dive? No, it just looks like corals so far. But let me double check. For example. Zoom in here, Dave. Nope, doesn't look like any sea pens so far. Okay, yeah, so that might be something we could be interested in collecting as we see it crossing this sand flat. Sure. All right, come on. What are we looking at here? So that's the, the stalk of one of those Sericolophus sponges, um, but it's lost its little catcher's mitt head, and there's a little shrimp on it. I think there's a tripod fish up ahead. Uh, yeah, I think so. We've seen a lot of tripod fish. We have. Yeah. Get a zoom here, Dave. It felt us coming. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Bonk. There it goes. Determined Ooh. not to be on camera. <laughs> <laughs> now. Can we do another 50 meter move, zero, 060? Zero? Thanks. How fast are we moving, ship? 0.5. Okay. Gotta get out ahead then. Do you want to look at anything? Oh, oh a little shark. See if we can zoom get a in. zoom on the head and shoulders. 
Well, this one's been in some fights. Wow, oh, very sensitive. Yep. Yeah. So that's uh, at Mopteris. I believe the common name is dogfish. Dogfish. Oh, two Syracolophus so close together. Yeah, it's a nice couple. You can get a good look at the front of that one. Yeah, there's something different at the base. Oh yeah, another sponge. Bunch. Why does it look all gross on the stock? Because um, the stock doesn't have uh, any cells that are going to be cleaning the sediment off of it. So oh, okay. it's just like little bits of sediment that have attached to the stock. But yeah, maybe we could also zoom on the base, see what's down there. Yeah, that looks like a different sponge. Yeah, it looks like a different species hanging out at the base. Is it common for different species to be found so close together? Um, sure. Yeah, we see things like this all the time. Do we know what they are? Uh, not always. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve's saying possibly an interesting sample if we could get that one at the base. Uh, have to stop the ship, right? Yeah, I can stop the ship. Fridge now. Just a uh, snippet, although it's pretty small. Can we hold position here? Thanks. You can wind it. I can just see how far away I am. So. You might want to suction it. Suction? Are we doing it? Yeah, we're doing a sample, I think. Looks real small. Band in gauges. Checking with Steve to see if a snip and s will suffice. <laughs> so snip and slurp. Is that what for? Oh, is it snip and slurp? If well, let's see. If you, I if don't know if we'll be able to snip zoom, it. Dave? Yeah. Let's see, look at look at it. It's yeah. less than four yeah. inches. It's All right. Slurp. Yeah. Let's see if we can slurp it. All right. So we're just going for the widget at the bottom down here. That's yeah. It? Yeah. That Yeah. Three attempts. 
some zoomage. That's good. You gotta fix this slurp thing so it doesn't it it goes, flop that way. Yeah, it flops down under the rail. It's really annoying. Do you want me to move backwards a little bit? Yeah, you might have to. All right. Argus is still moving. I can come down a bit. Bridge nav. Can we make a 20 meter move to four zero? Thanks. And jar five is available. Jar five. Oh, that went in nice. Oh, nope. Nope. <laughs> no. <laughs> Spoke too soon. Hold on. Get in there. Nice. It's in. All right. Got any thoughts on that one, Megan? Um, Species? It's family. a glass sponge. <laughs> Hexactinellida. <laughs> um, it depends on if it's, it looks soft, but I don't know, it could be crunchy. I'm not sure. It could be, like related to the Styriclopus, or it could be something different. <laughs> yeah, I would have to see the spicules. Yeah. Okay, pick up, catch up. So I'm pretty sure it's something different. Yeah, I saw something with a similar shape in the guide. Hyalonema, Hyalonema. Hyalonema. Maybe, but I didn't see a stalk on it. Yeah, no, the Hyalonemas are usually on stocks or have the, the spicule, long spicule attachments. So I'm not sure if that's what it would be. Hmm. Now some evidence of current flow here, the ripples. So we'll be approaching the uh, second terrace in about 50 to 100 meters. And we can, if it looks interesting, we can lateral along it. Roger that. Looks like we're in a happy position to get moving forward. Yep. All right. Bridge now. Can 
we make a 50 meter move, 060? Zero, Thanks. Curious, Megan. What, is, what it? is it? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I saw you peering. Hmm. I'm like, uh, is it nothing? It's probably nothing. Super there, Dave. Who? Huh. Got eyes? I have no idea what this is. Is it a, a rock? A shell? A shell, oh, maybe. It might be a shell. Yeah. It doesn't look like it's an alive. Yeah. But it's more of a Weird. something than I had previously thought. <laughs> Should we take it? <laughs> uh, let's wait and see if we see more. Someone is asking if there are flatfish where we are. Um, like flounder? Uh, the question says flatfish? Yeah. Oh. So I suppose they're wondering if there's fish on the bottom that we can't, that we are like maybe not seeing right away. Um, no, the, the fish that we see will, will be obvious. They're not going to have a lot of fish uh, hidden in sediment. Um, but sometimes we do get tongue fish on sediment like this, and they can be hard to spot because they blend in really well. And did you call them tongue fish? I think the tongue, flat yeah. fish tend to be more sensitive too. Like they, they tend to swim yeah, off. Yeah, they'll swim off the before we get there. Mm, I see. They feel the rumblings. Yeah. Yeah, tongue fish are, are in the, the flat fish group. Um, they lay on the bottom like flounder and they're kind of tongue-shaped. We're still, what, like 100 or so meters away from this steeper features? Yeah, it looks like. Um, 
Are you noticing any current down there, Hurt? 50 meters. Go hands off. Hmm. Can we zoom into one of those stalks that look like there might be zoanthids on it? Sure. There's not much current. Okay. Maybe a little. Branches. Okay, we do have some zo some zoanthids, but I think oh, these down. are tube anemones. Can we collect this? Uh, snip. Um, well, so there was another stock before it that had the same thing on it. So there was definitely more than ten inv individuals in this area. We could just yeah take a take a part of this or like take half of it. It might be hard to snip, but the whole thing will come right out of the sediment. Ah, well, all right. Uh, if that's going to get a more complete or better sample, yeah. Yeah, this is a smaller of the two stalks. Look at that little hermit crab. Yeah. Yeah. On the move. Hop up. So you did see one earlier. Oh yeah, there yeah. was another stock previous to this one that right. was bigger and had more. But uh, tube anemones are particularly difficult to collect, seeing as they usually root themselves in sediment, so like they'll pull down into it, or if they're rooted in a rock, you can't really like fish them out. But this one, these, this little group here, is on a sponge. Do you think a scoop would work or? A um, I think it might be easy just to pick grab. it up, grab it. It'll come right out of. Where do we have room for this? So we're grabbing the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Ford bio box B has some space. There's a coral in there, but I don't think it's um, a whole sample. Let me check. Oops. Bio box B would be our best bet for space. And what is in B? Uh, a plexoid yellow fan. Yeah, those should be fine together. On deploy mode. <laughs> Turn off the, <laughs> the bender. Can you zoom in, Dave? We're closed up. Yep. Gonna it up. Cradling it. Gonna stay. Oh, oh. Wow. still rooted. Yeah. yeah, you can you can grab it a little harder. Grab it harder. Yeah. Pull out like a like a carrot. Yeah, like a carrot. <laughs> that. <laughs> yep, you got it now. There it comes. Into starboard B, right? In forward box. Oh, forward. Yeah, we don't B. want it in starboard. It'll forward. Might blow out of there. This is 55? Yes, 55. Cool. Okay, zoom out, Dave. Uh, 
pull the camera back. <coughs> Camera's back. Right to back. Which side? The right side. As opposed to the wrong side? Yeah, there's a yellow plex sword in there. Great. All right. Perfect. Did the little hermit crab scuttle off? Yeah, probably uh, decided to hide from the giant ROV. <laughs> <laughs> it goes back to his friend. to tell. Like, you will not believe what I saw today. Someone is asking if we know how thick the sediment layer is, and um, is there a way to measure that? Okay. Uh, we could core it, uh, which we have been doing, but I think even if we get the full cores that we have on um, Herc, uh, they're still not big enough to get all of the sediment. But it varies. You can see when we see those uh, black rocks, like we haven't seen before, like obviously there's, you can guesstimate how much sediment there is, a couple millimeters, centimeters. Um, but here, we, we, we would have no idea. It's really very fine here, so it would probably not stick to our cores very cores. well either. That it's makes sense. You would definitely need a bigger core to more accurately get that information for this area. And their other question was about sonar. Sonar doesn't, it just measures the top, correct? Uh, yeah, well, it depends on the type of sonar. There's sub-bottom profilers that will penetrate the sediment and Let's check go to out. the bedrock. Ooh. Ooh. What is this? What is that? A nice That's a fish. shark. Or nope, it's not a shark. Not a shark. It's a cuskiel. Ah. Say that again? Cuskiel. Cuskiel. This one's got a really big chunk taken out of its tail. Huh. And then other fish also looked, you said it like it had been in a fight? Yeah. Or, or scraped. This is a dangerous area of the ocean. Apparently. Go ahead, Bridge. Oh, wow. Oh, that notch? Just, uh... Look at that. Hmm. OK, thanks. So Bridge let me know that we've got some weather approaching, but we should be fine. Okay. This is a Diplocanthopoma. So there's, oh, that's a nice shot of its head. Great shot. Is that the lateral line down the side? It is, and you see how um, there's like two sections of it, one that's up oh, higher yeah. and one that splits down lower. It's a great shot. This individual is probably quite old. It's very large. Why don't we ever sample uh, cuskiels? Um, because they swim away. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be like, yeah. Fish, not. Are, fish are difficult to sample with ROVs. Somebody sampled them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't us, though. Oh, how beautiful. You can capture them at in baited traps. They'll, they'll come. So they're also one of those apex predators in this environment. You got your cuskiels, your um, senefbrinkid, cutthroat eels, and your rat tails. Those are the, the big fishes down here. And if you put down a baited trap, they'll all come. Nice. 
Nice. All right, come on down. Well, there's another one. Huh. <laughs> oh. Cool. See if there's anything wrong with him. <coughs> So sandy areas like this are good foraging areas. Maybe it'll go for that shrimp up ahead. So this looks like a more complete tail. Yeah. Nice to see some fish for a change. A nice good sized fish. And they're not swimming away too fast. Crab. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Run, hermit crab. <laughs> Will he eat it? I mean, probably not, but it could if it wanted to. The hermit crab? What does it normally eat? It'll probably eat, like, other like some crustaceans like shrimps or s other small fish like a rat tail or no, a tripod fish it could eat a tripod fish if it could catch one mm. these types of fish will go to um, places like whale falls or other places for foraging it's a good sized fish that is. I think I saw a green sea cucumber over to the right. Okay. Nope. Oh, hi. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty chill because they know that they're they're the biggest thing out here. You see, oh, yeah. see that blom? Let it just be a quick zoom. Yeah, it just. Behind. Have we sampled sea cucumbers yet on this cruise? No, right? We don't have any. Um, no, we haven't no. made any sea cucumber collections. Yeah. It's very nondescript. Died. Yeah, <laughs> it just blends in with the sediment. It does. The first one that's like All right. Come on. not pink Yeah. or purple. All right, we can get going. Huh. Oh, Leilani, could you make a note um, on the Syrianthids that some of them should be fixed in formalin? Gotcha. Coming up on the yeah, we should be features. approaching something interesting soon. 20 some, to 30 meters. some rocks. <laughs> you feel that tingle in the sonar. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now. Can we make a 40 meter move 060 and slow down to 0.3 knots? 
Thanks. Oh, I see it. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can we sample this? <laughs> <laughs> With Why your not? drilling let's, arm? Let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> That'll fit. Marlene, yeah. could you get a screen grab of those ripple marks? Sure. This rock has some really interesting texture. Yeah. Yeah. You get on the cable? Oh, it's all a little. Something Ooh. swim there. That spirally one. Is that a stick of pathies? Oh, you're talking about the one on the right? Yeah, let, well, let's look at the bamboo since okay. it's right in the middle. Wanna We're going to want to see all of them. It's like three or four species on this one. Oh, yeah. Is this Mary's kind of bamboo or not? Um, it doesn't seem to be branching, so it's not. What's that thing behind it? Uh, that's uh, a black coral. Okay. A skinny one. Very. And then uh, stars of... Yeah, oh there's yeah. an ophiroid on the rock. A hydroid? Ophiroid. Ophiroid. So a brittle star. Okay. Very nice. Is the uh, ship holding here or? Um, we can hold position yeah, here. Yeah, let's hold so we can take a look at this yeah. uh, yeah, rock. Look at some of the other? Yeah. Fringe now. Can we hold position, please? Thanks. Yeah, we might want a snip of one of these uh, whip black corals. So this one sticking out on the lower right is a yeah, black. Yeah, both of these are the same. Is that a shrimp up top there? Yep, yep that's one of those long-legged shrimps. It's a big one. Maybe it just looks big to me. What's that yellow little thing? The ye yellow thing? Oh, to the right of the black coral. I don't know. I can yeah, we can't see it very well. So we'll snip the end of this one? Yeah. Oh, good eye, Coralie. Oh, it's like the tiniest crinoid. Oh, <laughs> little baby crinoid. Yeah, th so this is probably one of those ones that are free swimming, but when I they're mean, babies, um, they it's actually nice attach on, attached on to hard substrate, and then they'll eventually grow their cirri and be able to move away. You get a screen grab of that Argus shot? Already Thanks. done. Beautiful. Yeah, so this black coral is pretty wiry, so you definitely want to snip it pretty hard. Question mark coral. It's a stick of pathies. Is 
this okay? It's kind of moving around, so. Yeah. It looks like there was still a lot of space in the forward boxes, right? That we can put this one in? Yeah, yeah, you can just okay. drop it in one of the those boxes. Uh, like half is fine. to me. No. Okay, well. There's more than 10 on this rock, yeah, so there's we're lots okay. Of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're really Pretty tough. Yeah. Where's it going? Forward? And any one of the forward boxes. There's still plenty of space up there. Maybe A on the left. There's yeah. bamboo coral. Yeah, there's coral in there already. Um, probably put it in the one that doesn't have the bamboo. Okay, so then B. Yeah. Why not? Do they uh, not? Because they both like to make a lot of slime. On the right. Uh, so the right one. Sorry, Jake. Yes. yes. We've got to label those differently. Yeah. <laughs> they just need to be switched. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Is it floating? It, it might float a little bit. But once it sinks down, it should be fine. Oh. Hmm. Should we slurp it instead? Uh, a bit long it's too long. Probably get stuck up in there. Uh, for the slurp. It's looking better. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's like wire. I know. <laughs> Yeah, while we're doing this, they got 26 knots outside. Wow. Yeah. It's ripping. <laughs> yeah, it's a floater.
They remind me of those pipe cleaners you can get from the craft store. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little like that, yeah. but a little more squishy. And less bendy. It's not doing what we wanted to do. Yeah, they, they definitely like to keep their shape. start trying to close it. It's like a puzzle. Don't call it wire coral for nothing. <laughs> what happens if I just Yeah. And yeah. try to chop it. Chop. Oh you're muted, that's right. And maybe you could find lately like, if you could just get through that tough skeleton. Choppable. <laughs> <laughs> gotta sharpen those blades. Yeah, coral cutters. You gotta cut. Right. Maybe try closing the box on it. That just might. Get the yeah, maybe out. just trap it in there with the box. Mm. Trying. Just. Oh. oh. Go, oh. gravity, go. Uh. Oh. Uh, oh, it's getting away. It's oh. escaping. <laughs> <laughs> it's the end of it. it might. Yeah. If you can, like, bend it in the box and then you can open it and that might fit in. You mean by closing the box? Yeah, closing yeah. the box might bend it enough. You want to try closing the box, I'd see what happens? Go try for it. it. We'll have half of it floating up in the camera. <laughs> yep. Maybe I can chop it while it's held while rigid it's held, by that. Held. Don't pull it too hard so you strip all the polyps off. Yeah, just strip it like a <laughs> cob of corn. <laughs> <laughs>
this would be really helpful. And then just make a note that it's in two pieces. The rock in Argus is like so, <laughs> such a weird shape. Yeah. yeah. Good shot of our upcoming feature. Preview. Try sniffing it again. Zoom all the way out. I'm all tangled up here. Okay, zoom back in. So that Argus view, you can imagine how that was a like a part of a coral reef. Steve says he supposes it doesn't matter much that the animal is sticking partly out. The box plug is in in any way, so it's going to be exposed to warm seawater either way. The plug's not in? So if we leave it protruding out of the box, I guess it's fine. <laughs> According to Steve. Just see if we can kind of reduce. Oh, well, that's helpful. What's yeah. flapping around in front? <laughs> yeah, that helps. Okay. Uh, wait, wait, uh, there. Okay. Come zoom out a bit, dude. <laughs> that was a challenging oh. selection. Oh, mm -hmm. and now it's going to cooperate. That'll see. do. Wow. <laughs> cool. Yay. Yay. We did it. Good job, Bob. <laughs> the plug is in the port side partition. 
I saw it this morning. Sample 56. Cool, let's take a look at some of these other things on this rack, and then we can move on. So there's a, a bathopathies. Looks like this might be an unbranched primnoid coral. An interesting one up at the top there. Yeah. Might be a different the one that looks like a has three, three leaves on it. Yeah, a clover. Okay. <laughs> These are some interesting looking rock formations. What gives them the texture that they have? Um, so this is carbonate. Um, so it's old coral reef. And um, over time, it starts to pit and dissolve. So you get this weird texture. This is another type of black coral called umbellopathies. I always call it umbrella pathies. <laughs> <laughs> kind of looks like an umbrella. That's how I remember it. Yeah, well, we can move on. So there's a lot of yeah. those uh, stickopathies, the wire corals on this rock. Maybe there's a what is that? It's oh. all squishy. Oh, on the right? Oh, you yeah, mean on the, on the big, right? Yeah, squishy, squishy thing. thing. It's a weird shape. You know, is it a sponge? Looks like it might be. Maybe it's not Speaking squishy at all. <laughs> <laughs> Huh. Wow. That's real odd. Shaped like a pyramid. It, yeah, or a it bell. is. Or like a little hat. Yeah. Like, a gnome would wear that. The sorting hat of the oh. sea. Steve <laughs> said they saw these down below dead. It's it's upside down. I think it might have oh. fallen. Oh. oh, okay, okay. That makes more sense. I was like, <laughs> I've never seen a sponge do this. Yeah. Um, yeah, if it had fallen from somewhere, that would make more sense. Huh. Wild. Stock gave away. Okay. Yep, we're good. good. Totally thought it was going to be a sea cucumber. <laughs> well, there's some this branchy is, stuff. This uh, is much more interesting than the first terrace. Less sediment. You can really see the ancient coral reef formation. More biology so far. Yep. What is that red one? Crinoid. Crinoid. Yeah, Crinoid. Proisocrinus ruberemus. Hey, there's some uh, really black looking rocks, Coralie. Yeah, I saw, I just noticed those, those nodule looking things. Can we get over there? Yeah. Sure. It's like they're collecting their yeah. spilling down. Okay, this may be kind of a weird ask, but there's so many of them. How would you guys feel about taking a core of this? A core? Yeah. We have a scoop. 
But then each rock that we get counts as one rock. If we take a core, then we can take a bunch, and that counts as one sample. How would you core I don't think you could core oh, yeah. this. You can't get a core. You could scoop, maybe, but... Yeah, this is, like, on hard stuff. Yeah. So maybe just pluck... Difficult. Just pluck one? I think a scoop would count as one. It doesn't, Steve told me. Oh. But if we sco if we could scoop it with the core, then that counts as one sample. Oh my God. <laughs> How about we just pick a good looking rock? Uh, uh, this would be for Bob. So he'd probably want two. How many rocks do we have? Five. We have five. Well, they're, they're not exactly two nodules, so are they? They're they're not. But um, since they're so like broken, I can't use this to connect with current water temperature conditions because we don't know where they came from. Yeah. They're not exactly in place. He, he's actually more interested in, in uh, ones that would be found outside the monument. I see. So these aren't good collection candidates? No. All right. Well, Okay. I was like, they're the right color and they're not covered in sediment. <laughs> they are the right color. They're not covered in sediment. But it kind of looks like someone like dropped them here. <laughs> They're out of like place that. for sure. Yeah, so I. It's kind of random. Not great candidates for. Another day. Yeah. We could kind of look up that strip and see if they're kind of tumbling down. Oh, there's Ooh. an eridogorgia. Wow. It's eridogorgeous. <laughs> I haven't said that this cruise. <laughs> Steve says a scoop counts as one. A scoop counts as one. Can we get a zoom here, Dave? There might be good scoopability up beyond that. Scoopability. I love it. Oh, and there's a shrimp in the branches. Bathy Pale Manella. And it looks like she might have eggs. Oh. I see in the, the pleopods underneath the abdomen there. It's like really purple and fluttery. Yeah, looks like she's holding a bunch of eggs. What type of coral is this? This is an Eridogorgia. It's very distinctive with its spirally pattern of branching. So Eridogorgia magnispiralis, meaning it's got big spirals. Okay. Good here? Yeah. Mm. There's uh, that yellow coral up at beyond oh, it. Oh, yeah. It's looks like that. sword. Yeah, let's look, take a look at that. And a lot more darker rocks in the distance there off to the right. Oh, a little shell. A, shell a little shell. Those little snails. Now the question is, are those alive snails or not alive snails? Is there something on that coral? Yeah, yeah. so there's a, a snake star on that coral. So this is a, a plexoid coral. we often see this association of snake stars Sorry. on the branches of swords. Yeah. We'll also see them on other um, octocorals as well. Octocorals are protonaceous? Or not, no, no uh, the protonaceous refers to a skeleton. Um, so, so not all octocorals have protein skeletons, um, but they all have eight tentacles on their polyps. Okay. And next to it, you can see uh, the black coral. They're hexacorals, which means they only have six tentacles. With the black corals, you have two large, longer tentacles and four shorter tentacles per polyp. Okay, so what we'd like to do is uh, exp go along this r little ridge feature, this reef feature. Um, 
because it looks like there's some good animals growing on it. Yeah. Um, do you are you interested in any encrusted, you know, darker looking, even though it's going to be carbonate? Um, if it if it's like these ones off to the right there look. Yeah, it just loose, but. There's a fish down there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It might be the same kind that we saw before, but I'm not sure. Cuskeel? It might be a rat tail, actually. I think I see a dorsal fin. Oh. So do you want me to move up the top of the ridge, Emma, or on one, um, one side in particular? Or let's see. Forward? Can you kind of tilt up to see? Yeah. Oh, after we look at this oh, fish. One yeah. of the yeah. Alan's zoomed this fish. I'm going to get a zoom on it. Dave. Steve says rat tail. Yeah. Corymorpha. Corymphenoides. Oh, its eyes are so cute. Yeah. Yeah. They're so got big. Real big eyes. Very distinctly shaped head. Yeah. Nice pattern on its back. That was the bathroom tile pattern. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the the bathroom tile pattern that I want is for the tripod fish. Yeah, I think this like would do as well. Nice. Yeah, 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 this could be maybe, a good maybe countertop. Aww, yeah. he's so cute. They got really like pouty mouths. <laughs> like if you see their mouth, they have like a little um, barbel on their chin, and they kind of frown a little bit. <laughs> it's pretty adorable. I'm good with this fish. Roger that. All right. Corey more 40s. Um, yeah, just kind of go along the rim of this little okay. reef feature. If we need to step to the... Wait, so you're oriented towards the northwest, north-northwest, so yep. we kind of step in that direction maybe. Um. Three four zero. Or yeah, that should should be good. Okay. Bridge nav. Can we make a twenty meter move? Three four zero. There's more rocks on the left down in that little yeah. valley. So they're kind of collecting there. Yeah, and I think this is just the beginning of this feature. Yeah. Because uh, up ahead, we've got the big red splotch. Yeah, it's steep. It's steep. Yeah, after this step, if we kind of lose this reef feature, we can go northeast again and then step to the south. Any of these look interesting, Corley? So, I don't know, all of these nodules, they just look interesting. If Bob isn't interested in collecting any in the monument, then I might just assume to skip these. Just because I'm not sure where they came from, so I wouldn't be able to use these for my research. I would venture to say they broke off the reef features and then, but why they're so much darker? Yeah, that's. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's pretty I weird. mean, why would they get encrusted and not the reef? Unless the reef is encrusted somewhat, but it's so sediment covered. I don't know. But then why aren't they also getting sediment covered? <coughs> I think that's a little valley that the currents are flowing through and scouring them. Is that a stalked crinoid? It sure is. All right. I think it's like a channel I focusing the current. I love that color. I know, it's really gorgeous. I'm going to invent a lipstick and I'm going to name the color Stalked Crinoid. Sample one of them. Want to get see. one? Yeah. Maybe a big one. one. Can we go over here and try one of these big ones? Now, where would that go? We can put it at star starboard bio box D. That one's available. Okay.
And that's our going to be our sixth rock. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. Let me look for one. The one dead center looks nice. Yep. And Steve says, bonus coral. <laughs> There's coral on it. Ah. Can we get a zoom? Yeah, zoom in there. Oh, moving. Sorry. Is that like a little bamboo? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it might be another black coral. The ones that we've been seeing all over the place. Okay. Oh, the little wiry guys. The little wire ones. Jake's favorite. <laughs> That's loose. Can we turn it? Somewhat flat. Yeah. All right. Nice and dark. Nice. We'll take it. We'll see what happens. Oh, and a brittle star. Wait, is that a brittle star? Uh, I was didn't see it. There. Uh, where's it going? Starboard? Fox? Starboard Delta. What sample is this? 57. Mm. It's a long reach. Can you switch my cameras? Oh, sorry. I didn't even notice. I like the camera right there. <laughs> 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 goofy. Where to look? I was curious, what's in E and F? E, there's a large carbonate rock that we have to be kind of gentle with. And F also has a rock, but unsure of its size. Uh, gonna go in there. Just in case this doesn't fit. There it goes. Perfect. That box is four. One rock. All right. So, Corley, do you want to remind us what you're looking for on your samples? Yeah, so I'm looking for samples with ferromanganese crust which uh, you can see on these rocks, it's that black cover um, that's covering the rocks. So I would assume that the rocks underneath are carbonate, which are, you can see these kind of like large formations all look like, I'm assuming they're carbonate. Um, I think Steve said that this is a spur and groove formation that you see in ancient reefs. But um, ferromanganese crust are rocks that form on top of other rocks, and they form out of the ambient seawater. And uh, they pretty much take the metals and different elements that are in the seawater and put them into the rock, keep them there. Hmm. 
And did we finish that step? Good. Yeah, we finished that 20 meter step. Great. So yeah, I guess we can uh, start ascending and then if it becomes interesting again, lateral along. Okay. Nice. Nice group of corals on this rock. Yeah. Orange nav. Let's see what we got here. Can we make a 20 meter move, 060? It's like a black coral and a Ritagorgia. Yep, so we've got a bunch of those uh, stichopathies, those wire corals, the Ritagorgia. This might be Ritagorgia bella. Uh, Bella oh. has a Can we get an EDM yeah, here? Got it. Yeah, I was thinking Spiral the same thing. to it and all the um, polyps and branching happens right at the top. Which Niskins are open? If we want to do EDNA floating, Niskin Bob's three to six. Advance, so Yeah, if we could do one right here maybe. Wait for Bob to come back. Okay. I could sit down if you wanted, but I don't, usually you take them off the Yeah, bottom. just above this rock. Yeah. So uh, did you just put in a move? Uh, yeah, I did. Let's hold. Let's All right. Bridge now. Explore these until Bob gets back, and then we can pull an iskin. Yeah. Can we hold position? What step are we on? Zooms. The next one is 58. What has it been, Dave? So there's a small plexor coral with a snake star and this is a hyocrinidae. It's another type of stalked crinoid. Oh, and there's a different type of uh, wire coral. Close you see the yellow up. one? Hmm. Instead of the pink. Oh. What about the white? That's skeleton? Yep, so that looks like a old bamboo coral. Mm. There's a Chrysogorgia, that sort of long fluffy oh, yeah. looking one nice with the Europtychus in its branches. It's a type of squat lobster. For the start time, started at 1750. Sorry, 1950. Thinking 7 p.m. is 19. Ooh, check it out. Uh, you see that Ooh. little, like, red bubble that's on the Aritagorgia? Oh, is that a parasite? It's a jellyfish. <gasps> what? what? Yeah. Is it a parasitic jellyfish? It's a parasitic jellyfish. It wow. feeds on the Aritagorgia. Um, hmm. Rude. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's called Agenoina. I don't think I'm saying that right. So does it just kind of float along until it finds itself a, a, jet, a host? Yeah, a host, and it, yeah. then it'll like settle down and hmm. nom so, it. So, Bob, we're going to try to get in. Oh, sorry. He's just hopping on the... Yeah, bike. we're going to try to get an eDNA here, Bob, just above, hovering okay. above the rock. Wanna come by, Dave? Just so I can see where we're at in the location. So yeah, in the vicinity. Alright. Doesn't have to be right above it. So Steve said that jelly's not just parasitic, it's actually predatory. Wow. It's likely a new species, but preys on bamboos and chrysogorgid corals. Sampled yeah. extensively last year at Hal and Baker. All right, right back. All right, so which bottles? Niskins three to six are available. Can you explain to us what we're sampling? 
we are That's gathering three. a water sample with our Niskin bottle. So Herc is going to pull the trigger to close one of these bottles and capture okay. a water sample. Are we watching? Yep. Yep. Fired. Triggered. Okay. That was Popped. three, right? Yes. Zero, five, eight. Uh, so we just closed bottle number three. So that collects a water sample, then it'll be analyzed later ashore for evidence of DNA. Environmental DNA left behind by Oops, dang it. Oops. either these corals or fish that might have passed through. Or Sorry. Force a habit. We're going <laughs> to fix that after this time. Did you touch yep. the blue button? <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> Hewitt Craft said we no longer need to hotwire it. It's like 27 years of <laughs> habit. <laughs> <laughs> Did it again. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Should put a cone of shame on the blue button so you can't yeah. touch it. Uh, yeah, we need a little yeah. cover over it. Though. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to like actively like lift the cover. You have to hit it when you power it up. You have to hit the blue button. But a button cover for the button. <laughs> button. Yeah. <laughs> that was well. a good rock. After this dive, it'll be all back to normal. Well, hmm. We don't have to worry about it no more. Is that also a coral over there? Yeah, that might be uh, one of those Victor Gorgia. It looks kind of purple. Want to go check it out? Yeah, let's take yeah, a quick look out. at it. it. Decided to be different. It's not on the rock with the rest oh. of the corals. <laughs> Well, you don't want to get too close to all those other corals. They'll steal your food. You kind of like spread in. out nicely. So you have to hit the blue button before you kill the craft power, or it, it hangs call. this. Uh, <laughs> you got to cycle power over here. Oh, that's a nice <laughs> color. So Steve says a nice park bench here. <laughs> mm, yeah, I totally have that in my garden. What are we looking at here? This is a Victor Gorgia alba, a type of octocoral. It's pretty distinctive with its beautiful purple color. And in the branches, you have a snake star. That's a nice purple. It is. So the snake stars, they do they just use the coral for support so they can filter feed? Yep, pretty much. Uh, they help the coral keep clean, and, and the coral provides them a nice place up off the seafloor. So it's mutually beneficial for both of them. Is that a brittle star? It is. It is a brittle star. Why isn't it pink? Because brittle stars can come in many colors. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't like that, you don't like that answer? Because <laughs> it's not corally. They come in many shapes and sizes. Ooh. I feel like that's a, a lucky umbellopathies. It's got four leaves instead of three. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> a four leaf umbellopathies. Mm. It's a nice dark background. There's a little fish or something that keeps floating in and out of Argus Cam. Oh, yeah. I see that. What are you? I don't know. It could be a halosaur. So I think we have to collect this for good luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've only seen two so far. Ugh. It's got a little it's shrimp on it.
so that shrimp is a uh, levius. You often see these shrimps on corals and sponges. Is this also a symbiotic relationship? Yeah, the, the shrimps just sort of hang out on the uh, on the corals. I don't know if they do anything to assist the coral, but they don't hurt them. All right, I'm good with this. Okay. Come on. now. Um, can we make a 20 meter move 060? Thanks. All right, Jake, time to swap seats. All right. Then you can come over here and do your numbers. <laughs> <laughs> About how far that next, uh, that last waypoint, the final waypoint there. Let me zoom out. Um. Ten. Hundred and eighty-nine meters. Okay. Yeah, and I'm not quite heading towards it. Uh, heading towards the most interesting looking area. Yeah. Can I reset your DVL? Okay. There's a little sea pen down on in the sediment over there. Megan, we have someone asking how aggressively the corals are attached to the mm -hmm. um, to the rocks, or I, I suppose is it easy or difficult to tug them off? How strong do they have to stay attached? Um, well, it depends on the coral. Some um, of them are really lightly attached, like that stick of pathies that we picked up just kind of popped right up. <laughs> um, but some of those bigger bamboo corals, their bases are, are very strong uh, and they need to have a very strong base because as the current rips by them, they need to hold on. So they reinforce their bases and make those bases very strong to the rocks. And even after the coral has passed on, you'll see that base scar uh, from where the coral used to be. Zoom in, Dave. Sea pen. It is a sea pen. <laughs> it looks like an anthoptylum, but it's in the sediment, so I'm not sure. That's Steve's guess. Tough to say. Mm -hmm. Nice shot, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really good shot. Sea pens can be quite difficult to identify sometimes. It's pretty. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's great. I think these ripples are symmetric looking, could be wave action. So, and this would be a spot where you'd get internal waves generated right where you've got a sharp change in the relief at this uh, terrace. Was 
they're hitting. Zero six zero. Now, would these internal waves be generated from like really far away? No. Well, could they could propagate down from the Hawaiian Islands, but these could very easily be generated locally as the tide encounters this seamount. It'll huh. generate waves right along the the rim of the geo. And certain spots along the slope. There's a sponge on the rock over there on the right. It's very round. It cool. is round. And there it is. So it could be something like a hylonema chorionema. They're ferronematid sponge that has sort of this pot belly look to it. What is its common name? Oh, sometimes we call it a pot belly sponge, but there's no official hmm. common name. I think that would be the perfect official common name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're just kind of round. And you can see the osculum at the top, that's that round opening. And what does that do? Um, so sponges are filter feeders. So they have to filter the water um, in order to get their food. So you have all these pores and spaces for water to flow in and out of the sponge. Bridge nav. Can we make a 20 meter move zero six zero? Thank you. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. It's gorgeous. There are just so many wire corals around here. Oh, and another diplocanthopoma. Ah, oh, we've seen some of these. No offense to this fish, but... The Cuscio? Yep. Well, actually, um, they're not technically Cuscios, but they're in the Ophidiaformes. <laughs> uh, I forget what the common name is, but they're, the family is Bifididae instead of Ophididae. Could we try and sample one of these rocks? Where were you circling? Uh, oh. uh, maybe something over here. That's a little oh, tight. Probably not in there. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's too hard for her to get in there. Maybe something back oh. here beyond these boulders. Yeah, there's, there's a bunch of options. Or, yeah, I was, could probably pivot around and get one and try one of those. Actually, what about this one? It might be attached. We'll see. Oh, Oops. Yeah, there's a nope. big rock right nope. there. Okay. Then one of these is good. Yeah. Hey, Jake. Yep, let's do it.
Circle that one again. That one. Could even do that smaller one actually. And then we could put it in one of the smaller one of these. There's a Corral Morpharian. Ooh. You see those little uh, little dots on the end of, of the tentacles? Over there? Yeah. Type of anemone? Yeah, so it's another one of those anemones that aren't in the anemone group. Mm. And they're very distinctive with their little white dots. Yeah, on the tips. On the ends of, oh yeah, on the tips of those tentacles. Uh, this one right here? Could we get that one, the smaller yeah. one? To the right. Uh, so. This one. Oh god. That one. Yep. I see it. Sure. Might be stuck in there. Oh, yeah, I don't uh, think that one's no, coming. The one to the left might have budged. Okay. But I'm not. got room the, for it. Uh, bender off. Mm, that's a bigger okay. rock. Right. Jumping. Jumping. Yeah, jumping, jumping. Do any of these samples say how big they are in the descriptions? The first one is a small black one. Okay. Let's try and put it in that box first. Okay. That's encrusted. Yep. We have about a medium sized rock. Looks good. All right, going in the starboard box? Yep. We're gonna try to put it in A. There's a small rock in there already, so we're hoping this one fits inside with that one. Uh, five? Yep, five. It's rock number seven? Yes. Rock seven. Starboard A. Oh. 
to this. Oh my. I don't have to go in F then. Can we try one of the go, other? Go in there. Just, just have to rotate a little bit. Well, we have someone asking what our proximity to the international date line is. We're about 18 degrees east of the date line. We're about 162.5 west, so. Is that relatively close? It's a time zone oh, that's away. It's a nice little time zone away. See, that's a Tina for Megan. Yeah. Ooh. Once we're all stowed, could we get a zoom on that? Um. Wait, he's coming back. <laughs> oh, he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a nice view. Wow. 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 You can see that uh, its stomach is that red color, and so just in case it eats something that's bioluminescent, it won't glow. Mm -hmm. That's neat. You can see the comb rows now. Oh, it almost looks like you can the see some bioluminescence on there. On oh, no, that's just the light, light no? reflecting off the comb rows. That looked cool. Yeah. It's pretty. Like some purples and blues. Yeah, for a second. like rainbows. Yeah, right there. Oh, that's cool. Tiffany will be excited. All right. I'm good with this. Thank you. Very nice. We'll keep climbing. Uh, you want to kill the craft power? Out the Wait, let me, yeah, I'm going to hit the blue button. Blue button. Now we'll power. Kill power. Got about an hour, ten minutes left before we have to leave bottom. I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> You're like, oh, she's getting antsy. She wants to call in a ship move. No, I thought you were going to want to see something a cucumber over there? Oh, no. We have to catch up. Yeah, we're no. Like way out. In the, yeah. What's that pink thing? You want to see that? <laughs> I think it's just a sea cucumber. Oh, not just a sea cucumber. Sea cucumbers <laughs> are pretty cool. Oh, we've seen a lot of them. I want to see us catch up is what I want to see. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're driving the bus. <laughs> you got a bigger bus than I got. <laughs> <laughs> you got the bus with the view, though. Yeah.
point. <laughs> well, that's a beautiful bathy pathies. So it's hard to tell. That, are we actually going up a fairly steep wall right now? Climbing? Uh, it's not like vertical. It's okay. Definitely got some relief to it. There's uh, a slime star. Ooh, high like star. Oh uh, no, I'm good on the slime star unless somebody else wants to see it. We, no. We've seen a few of these. I got my slime star joke in, you know, last night, so. <laughs> Can you repeat it for the audience? Oh, about uh, Coralie's roommate <laughs> oh, having yeah. the same oh, yeah. amount of mucus. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. He is needing a sponsor at Kleenex. <laughs> That would actually be if Kleenex donated to ocean conservation for <laughs> slime stars. You know, any donation would be appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Kleenex, time to step up. <laughs> calling them out. For the slime stars, you know. Megan, someone would like to know what type of predators prey upon sea cucumbers. Um, not much eats sea cucumbers, so they don't really have a lot of predators. Sometimes okay. there are some parasites um, that they can have, um, but yeah, there's not a lot that really wants to eat a sea cucumber. Do they lack nutritional value? Yeah, they don't really have uh, much going for them in terms of nutrition. Um, their skin is full of ossicles, so these little spiny bits. Um, that's where the name uh, Echinodermata, the, uh, the phylum that sea cucumbers are in, spiny means skin. spiny skin. So, yeah, they're not they're not the most nutritious. They they eat sand and dirt, so it, they're filtering or they're consuming the org organic matter uh, found in the sediment. So they're, they're not really high in nutritional value. And they're mostly water. So if you were to collect one, they kind of deflate like uh, water balloons if you <laughs> rupture their skin. Do sea cucumbers at this depth eject um, cuvarian tubules like the reef sea cucumbers do? Or it, do they have a different defense mechanism down at this depth? Um, I don't know if they, they do that defense mechanism. Um, it's never been witnessed yet. Normally when we like make a collection of them, they'll, they'll just poop. Oh, interesting. Uh, and try to swim away is usually their defense mechanism. So, you know, they'll drop some ballast and take off. I guess at this depth with very little food around, it would take a lot of energy to um, eject all of that, probably. Yeah, and then to regrow. Um, yeah, and to regrow that, because it's pretty much like their internal guts that they're spinning out, those cover and tubules, right? Yep. So I guess that would be disadvantageous at this depth. Too much energy. Yeah, for sure. Hmm, can we zoom this coral? Zoom in, Dave. Top bird's eye view, fish eye view. So this looks like a primnoid coral. Mm. 
might be uh, something like Norella diconema. Looks pretty happy here. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a good one. All right, I'm good with this. Interesting set of boulders. It is getting very bouldery. Ready for uh, a ship move? Mm, yep. All right. Bridge now. Can we make a 20 meter move, zero six zero? I think it's a sack of calyx over on the left. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we saw a couple of those last night. Wire coral. So this wire coral looks uh, different from the one we collected. The polyps are a lot smaller and. Hmm. Ready to go. Ready to run off to. <laughs> yep, it's really long. <laughs> so you'll notice uh, a number of corals will have this sort of whip like body form, basically colony shape. And that's advantageous to being able to move in any direction. Black corals have a protonaceous skeleton that's very flexible and extremely strong, as we saw when we were trying to collect it. <laughs> it just would not bend or break. So especially in high currents, it could be really useful. Can we get a zoom on this coral? Which one? This one. Uh, the talking about the uh, black, the whip? The, the black coral, maybe. Zoom in. 
Steve doesn't think it's a black. He doesn't think this is a black? So... Should we collect it? I think it's black. I see black skeleton. But I'm down for a collection of this. It's definitely different. Where would we put it? Um, if we could snip and slurp. Yeah. yeah. That's where we have space right now. Six Let's seven. try it then. Okay. Good rain, Jake. Steve agrees a black coral, but not sure yeah, what, it might, which one. Yeah, it might not be the stickopathies. It might be something different. And uh, we observed some different types of black whips the last time we were here, and there was not a lot of consensus in the community about what the species is. So it's definitely on our list of high priority collections. All right. What chambers is Good. going in? Yeah, I think six is open. Six and seven, yes. Those are our last two jars. Where am I looking? Here. That line up right. Looks good. Zoom? Yeah. And your mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. How much do we want? Uh, about half is good. Get on the plane, is that enough? Yeah, that should be enough. I think you got it. Yep. yep. Uh-huh. <laughs> that was extremely satisfying. <laughs> Spaghetti. There he is. There it is. In, in the jar. It's nice to get a high priority collect. Still come on up, coming up on the steep part. Yep. We're getting close. Anything you can correlate with that little outage we had on the hurt camera? Just went to black. Oh, it did? Came back, yeah. So oh, at this depth, I, I daylight has... The bio or the 
Or no consequence on the right. sea life, correct? We're, yep, we're deeper than a thousand. There's Interesting. few, if any, photons reaching this depth. But the is that what you want to know? Phase of the moon could. Yeah, that's yeah. the second time it's happened on this dive, uh, where all of a sudden. Uh, I'm gonna try it again. See if I can. Yeah. The strength of the tides can affect right, the bucket. flux of the on. nutrients. Oh, you know what's probably going on is if you if you turn on both cameras. Oh. Uh, indirectly, the well, we're at the equator, so there's not a lot of. It's just uh -huh. above the equator, not a lot of variation in sunlight throughout the year. Huh. In the northern latitudes, though, Weird. you get a spring bloom and a fall bloom, which would uh, make more food available, raining down as marine snow. Okay, That makes it sense. Best. So it trickles down differently yeah. depending on... There's a seasonal daylight. pulse there, yeah. Off the hydraulic power or craft power, sorry. Craft power off. Relay isolation, bender back on. Okay. Oh. You want to look at them or no? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it only has four arms. They should have five. What's oh. going on? Maybe it's hidden? Did it, go, did it get eaten? I don't know. That's weird. I mean, it looks like... looks symmetrical. Yeah. So weird. Where would the fifth arm go? <laughs> I mean, if Coralie could be right, it got eaten off or something. Zoom in, Dave. Yeah, so yeah it would be good to get a zoom on the bot. Huh. <laughs> but it doesn't look damaged. No. It looks perfectly fine. Yeah. That's, what that's an strange. anomaly. Yeah. Four is good enough. Four armed sea star. This sea star is the family Goniasterity. So that's part of the cookie stars. What are the little spikes called? Um, I don't know. Steve is guessing hypisteria. Yeah, it could be a hypisteria. Um, there's these like little moth-like structures on the surface. Those are called pedicellaria. Ooh. But I'm sure the little little spikes have a name too. Everything's got a name. What is this stuff behind it? Two feet. Those are yeah, the tube feet. Oh. That's how they walk around. With many feet? Yeah, with all the feet. Alright, I'm good here. Here you know. Thank you. Four legged sea star. Quad star. Quad, Quad star. star. Another purple sea cucumber. Are you looking or? No. no. <laughs> I'm going on these. Yeah. 
right. <laughs> Ignore. It's pretty cool the first 40 <laughs> times. <laughs> more corals, more corals. Megan, what was your master's thesis on? Uh, my, my thesis was on uh, deep sea corals off the coast of the big island of Hawaii. I was looking at the um, structure and development of deep water coral communities on lava flows and how those communities might change over time using the lava flows as a basis for the age of the community. So younger lava flows would be younger communities and older lava flows would have older communities. Interesting. How did you collect your samples? Um, so their video transects were collected using the Pisces 5 submersible and the Deep Discover ROV. Bridge now. Can we get a 20 meter move 060? Thanks. Do they still do maintenance on the Pisces or is it just mothballed? Yeah, they're just mothballed. They're sitting in base six over there at the Marine Center. Yeah. They haven't been touched in a couple years. It's kind of sad. Did you go down to the Pisces? I did. Wow. Nice. It was awesome. <laughs> I have a lovely time. <laughs> so Scott Waters has a Pisces sub in the uh, Canary Islands. Mm -hmm. Tenerife, yeah, he's he just had some uh, dives there. He's showing on. Are you on his? No. Instagram or no? No, oh, he's still diving his. He he bought it as a uh, just privately oh, for okay. himself and fixed it all up. Yeah, he paid the, wow. for all the repairs and now he operates it. That's great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> He lived in Kansas, and now he lives in the Canary Island. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big move. Yeah. He bought it and took it to Kansas and then fixed it all up. Yeah. So well, after you, uh, the University of Hawaii uh, decommissioned their ship, the KOK, the Kaimi Kai O Kanaloa, um, we don't have a ship that can launch the Pisces submersibles anymore, so... No more maintenance had been done on the subs since then. But we still have the uh, LRT, the launch recovery uh, barge. Ah. Uh. Yeah. So it would be so cool to, to use that again. <laughs> Basically, it's this uh, platform that you can strap the sub to, and it sinks underwater. And then it's operated by divers, and the divers will then detach the sub and then bring the LRT back to the surface, and the sub flies off, does its mission. When it comes oh, wow. back, the LRT sinks again, the sub lands on top of it, they strap how, it how down. Far, how deep does it sink? Um, not too far. Probably like 50 feet, 100 feet. So, Herc, I'm looking at the Argus view. Is that just sediment to the left? Probably. <laughs> If you were able the to white, the yeah, white there? Yeah. yeah. It might just be sediment at the base of a, the rock. Back in the early days of Alvin, when it was on Lulu, it was on a platform that was lowered by chains. And uh, at one time, one of those chains broke. Oh, no. And the hatch was open, and the sub went to the bottom oh, no. <laughs> with the hatch open. Shoo oh, no. yeah. So it was down there for a year or so, and then the <laughs> Illuminat submarine went down and recovered it. That's wow. crazy. Yeah, they actually did some experiments on the lunches that were inside the sub. To see, that they were in pretty good shape. Like, <laughs> like they were, they hadn't uh, nothing rotted came away. Anything? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's wild. Someone's ham and cheese sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, it's just sediment. Yeah, they used to launch it with the hatch open, and the pilot would stand up in the sail and drive it. Oh. And, uh, yeah. This one's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> they stopped doing that. <laughs> I wonder why. Yeah, it seems like really unnecessary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was a pilot named Ralph that would he would climb up there. First thing he would have a cigarette up in the <laughs> up there. cigarette and a beer. I mean that was back when they had a beer machine on the uh, you know a beer uh, yeah beer dispenser machine. It was different back then. It was, yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Oh, that's a nice looking coral. Yeah, when I went down, we definitely got into the sub and in, closed Dave? the hatch before we launched yeah. it. Yeah. It bobs around quite a bit <laughs> at the surface. Yeah, it's, it's horrible to be in there in heavy weather. I'd been in there when my observers were all... Uh, Throwing up in the plastic bags. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. All the sediment looks, it's playing tricks on my eyes and the Argus view. Every, it looks like sponges all over the place and it's just white sediment. Yeah, just little sediment patches. Yeah. That's a nice zoom. Yeah, so that's another primnoid coral. Maybe a Calyptrophora. You can tell by the three, the three things that come um, out. I'm looking at the way it's branching. So Clyptophora tend to branch in a planar pattern at regular intervals, sort of looking more lyrate. And do we have a move on or? Um, we do not. Oh, all right. Looks like maybe we could keep stepping. Yep. Yeah, we can go on. See if we can get close to waypoint 10. Probably not. We'll see. All right. Carrying on. Bridge now. We'll just have to. Can we make a 20 meter move? 060. Zero. Ooh, crinoid. Thanks. Oh, there's a, a bamboo coral that is thus passed on, but you can really see the skeleton and why it's called bamboo. bamboo. Mm -hmm. So bamboo corals have oh a two-part wow. skeleton, part with a uh, calcium uh, carbonate, so like that hard like part, and then a proteinaceous the articulated wall. part, yeah. and that makes them quite flexible and strong. Wow, that's really um, cool. And it looks kind of like a bamboo plant. So that looks very much like a bamboo plant. So this one's branching at the nodes. Um, that means that those articulated proteinaceous parts is branching, is uh, occurring at the branch points. So we call that nodally branching. But we can also see corals where um, those nodes are occurring in between branch points. So we call those internodal. I think I see why it's red on the slope map now. Yep. Yep, it's coming up. Big cliff. You can look in the. Uh, All right, I'm good here. Starboard cam on her. Not. Bio box cam. Flat wall. We just kind of come vertically up it. Let's take a look at it on the way. I do have a 20 meter move on. I bet we'll see some nice corals and sponges on the swamp. There's Ooh. one. Yep, there it is. Mm. It's gorgeous. You manifested that. Wow. Uh, oh. Uh -huh. oh, look. Oh, wow. Awesome. Oh. It's like oh. a rainbow. This is what I've been waiting for <laughs> all time. <laughs> just oh, two my corals. corals. Mm. And uh, Dave. 
Is that a squat lobster? Yep, there's a squat lobster. Uh, that one's Sternostylus. And what's happening here is we have a yellow zoanthid, zoanthid. so a pair of zoanthid that's overgrowing this bamboo coral. So this is a bamboo coral, and it has a, a parasite, basically, growing over its skeleton. Oh, wow. And sponges behind it on the rocks. And so this parasite is a different type of coral. It takes over the, mm. the bamboo skeleton. Yeah. Yeah, it's totally wow, taken cool. over. Oh, wow. In the Argus view, you can see there's lots of corals on this this, this feature. And there's a plexor, oh, yeah. there's, there's that small yellow coral, and then that pink one that we're looking at right now is a hemicorallium. And there's quite a few at the top. Yeah. Yeah, I think I got to start coming up here. Yep. yep. Do you want me to hold... Well, we've completed our move, so... Uh, do you think I need to back Argus off a little bit? Uh, I think it's I can a, just come it up. A, it looks okay. Okay. Yeah. You just can't stop and smell the roses as much. <laughs> yeah, I'll just see what's up top and on the back side. It looks pretty thick, too. There yep. are lots of bamboos here. Uh, can we get an Iskin at the top of this boulder? Yeah. We have two left? Can we snap zoom that sponge? We have three left. Yeah, zoom in, three. Dave. Good. Uh, it looks like a, a uretid, so a glass sponge in the family uretidae. It would be kind of a crunchy one. And there's a tubular.